first presentation with Richard um, this morning, and uh, it will be followed at 10 o'clock with Marvin Carlson, um, who also is here, Mary Ellen is here, the Double Edge Theater, Carlos, and, and many others, so uh, Paula. So thank you all for coming, and uh, I think this is a real uh, contribution to our field, and really, uh, Richard, again, thank you for taking the time and, uh, and trusting us that we will be able to do this. Thank you. staff here, you've been marvelous, and uh, uh, win, lose, or draw, we've already won. Uh, now, in terms of what I do, I'd like to have less light on me and more light on the audience, so that's exactly the way I uh, work things. So let's bring the lights down a little bit over here. Well, first of all, we're going to have to turn them out when we see the slides and bring them up, because I don't believe that spectators should ever be in the dark, and uh, it's not the kind of theater I've ever done, and it's not the kind of, as you'll see, and it's not the kind of theater I want to do today. Uh, secondly, the uh, time with Marvin and I of talking about my productions is two hours, not one hour, and it'll begin when uh, Risha and I are finished. We'll take a little break and we'll begin. Since we're not running the railroads, and anyway, the railroads are late, we'll probably not be exactly on time, but we'll try to adhere as much to the schedule as possible. With the, without further ado, I want to introduce my uh, colleague, Rishika. You have her bio in your programs, but she and I have worked together very closely for four years on the Ron Lee Project. Obviously, Rishika is from uh, South Asia, and so she is uh, born to it, and I came to it through my second birth, probably, as Jaya Ganesh, uh, a, an initiation that occurred in 1971 in, uh, outside of Madras. That's another story, maybe I'll talk about it tonight. But at any rate, uh, Rishik and I have worked for a long time together on the Ram Lila, and I'm gonna turn it over to her now, and she's going to uh, talk a little bit and interrogate me, and we'll also have a little slideshow so you know what the Ram Lila is. Okay, yes. First of all, Rishika and I are working on a book. Uh, it's under contract by Niyogi Publishers in India. It'll be a book that will feature some of the photographs that I've taken and that Rishika has uh, uh, curated the archive of, and she'll talk about that. But those, there are nearly 8,000 photographs that I've taken over the years. And one of the marvelous things about today for me is that it's the first attempt at least to integrate my work, at least in my mind, <laughs> to some degree. I don't know how many of you have the uh, uh, fortitude to stay from now till uh, 8 o'clock tonight. But uh, I, I've done work in many, many different things, so this is a chance to see how they connect or how they don't connect, because I'm very good at uh, sustaining contradictions, as some of you who've worked with me know all too well. Uh, Romley love Ramnagar. The, one of the great founding uh, stories, myths, beliefs of Hinduism is the story of Ram. Uh, Rama is his uh, Sanskrit name, but Ram is what he's called in North India. He's the uh, seventh uh, incarnation, is it seventh? Yes, of uh, Vishnu. And he comes to uh, descend to earth to rid the world of the ten-headed uh, glorious demon king Ravan of Lanka. Uh, it's a story that is very cognate with the Indo-European myth of a great war fought to recover a stolen wife. We know it from the Greek I Iliad, uh, and we know it from the Ramayana, and they're, very, they're, they're the same story told in different modes, and in my view, they originate from the same mythopoetic base. Uh, the Ramlila Ramnagar is a 31-day cycle play performed in Ramnagar, which is a, a town across the river from Banaras, also called Varanasi, also called Kashi, a sacred or the most sacred, probably, city in India on the Ganges, or Ganga River, as I will call it, as it's called in India. The 31 days is the longest of any Ramlila. Uh, there are thousands of Ramlilas performed in the autumn uh, of each year, the month of, the month of Ashvin uh, in, uh, in North India. But the Ramlagar Ramlila is regarded by Indians themselves as preeminent. It is sponsored by the Maharaja of Benares. It's interesting because there is no legal Maharaja. 
1947 uh, ended the princely states, or rather the independence of India, and two years later the princely states were discontinued, but everyone in Benares calls him Maharaj, and he is a king. So the way I like to think of it is the Ramlila, the story of Rama, is a leaning card, and it is supported by the Maharaja, whose patronage gives this performance its identity. At the same time, the Maharaja is supported by the uh, existence of the Ramlila, which gives him a reason for continuing to have his ceremonial and ritual authority. He has other things that he also does, but this is his primary uh, ceremonial uh, duty. The 31-day play, in a nutshell, tells the story of uh, Ram's incarnation to rid the world of Ravan, uh, Ram's marriage to Sita, who is an incarnation of Lakshmi, uh, one of the principal goddesses of Hinduism, uh, the uh, interrupted coronation of Ram when uh, he is sent into it or agrees to go into exile for 14 years. And during that exile, Ravan kidnaps Sita, takes her to Lanka, and it's the India we know. Here's India, that triangle, and off the coast of India, the southeast coast, is the country of Sri Lanka, called Lanka in those days. And Ram gathers a great army in pursuit of, uh, of Sita. He doesn't cross the sea as uh, Agamemnon and Menelaus do, but he crosses the sea of the great forest of India down from uh, uh, Ayodhya, which is up near Benares to some degree, across towards where Bombay is, down angles across to a place called Rameshwar, and across into Lanka. He is aided by an army of monkeys and bears, the most uh, well-known of which is Hanuman. He wages that great war. He uh, slays Ravan. He recovers Sita. He returns to Ayodhya, his capital. He is installed as king, and the golden age of Ram Raj, the rule of Ram, begins. That's the story in a nutshell. If I don't know it, no one does. <laughs> ah, let's look at it. Uh, so th let's get the lights out here, and let's uh, very quickly look at it. I won't explain too much of it uh, beyond saying what the slides are. Uh, so there's the journey of Ram. Uh, uh, you can see the green line is going through India to Sri Lanka at the bottom. There the Ramayanis, which are 12 uh, Hindu priests who chant the Ram Charit Manas. There are uh, layerings of texts, and we'll talk about them later, but one of the texts is the 16th, uh, 17th century Hindu, uh, Hindi epic called <coughs> Ram Charit Manas, the reflections of the deeds of Ram, which is a retelling in uh, 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 late medieval Hindi or early modern Hindi of the Sanskrit Ramayana by Valmiki. And this text, Ram Charit Manas, is considered to be sacred in and of itself, and every word of it is recited in the Ram Lila. There is uh, Ram, uh, and uh, you can see how glorious he is. He is a boy of 12 or 13 before his voice has changed. And uh, the, he and his three brothers, uh, Bharat, Lakshman, and Shatrug, are all uh, 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 pre-adolescent boys. And Sita is also. And there is uh, Sita. Uh, uh, well, and here they are rehearsing. Uh, we, uh, uh, in this particular tape, I could show you how they rehearse, but it is it is not only a, uh, a religious uh, uh, occurrence, but it is a theatrical event. It's truly theater. Leela means play or theater. So it's truly theater and it's truly ritual at the same time. As my friend Victor Turner was fond of saying, make-believe gets transformed into make-belief. And it's not the willing suspension of disbelief, it's the active engagement of belief. Uh, here is uh, Ram's capital, Ayodhya, and you see some elephants in the back there. I want to make sure you see what I'm seeing. Yes, you see some elephants in the back, and that's where the Maharaja attends. He attends all but a few of the leaders. He does not watch Ravan get killed. He does not watch King Dasarat of, uh, of Ayodhya die. He says it's not proper for one king to witness the death of another. Here's where Ram goes into exile early on, Chitrakut. All of these places are actual places in India, and people can go visit them actually in India. They exist. They are pilgrimage centers. But for the Ramlila, the, 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 the small becomes the large. The Ramnagar becomes these places. And many people come and take actual pilgrimage, because if the boys, the Swarups as they are called, if they become uh, gods, and they are gods when they are in their proper costumes and wearing their crowns, then these places are the places 
they represent. So this is theater which does not give up its representational qualities, but also has a numinous quality. It is what it is, as well as being what it represents at the same time. You have to sustain that <coughs> tremulous uh, uh, coexistence of theatrical and actual realities. Uh, in a, some ways, it's parallel to the miracle of transubstantiation which the Roman Catholic Church proclaimed during the Eucharist. Though I can say for sure, I'm not a Catholic, so I don't know how deeply believed this is by all people, but I can say that in Ramlila, the people believe very much that the boys are the gods. Uh, his, this is a view of uh, Lanka, the uh, capital of, uh, of Ravan. It's a huge place, and the crowds that come there for the final battles and the slaying of Ravan range from 50 to 80,000 uh, when the weather is good, and a few hundred to a few thousand when the weather is bad. Uh, like uh, National Football League, the Ramlila pretty well goes on in all weather. And the weather is uh, sometimes rainy and stormy early on, and then it gets uh, better as it gets closer to the end of the 31 days. This is the uh, uh, Bharat Milat near the end of the exile. Ram has already slayed Ravan. He's come back, and you can see the highway signs because this takes place right in the center of the town. So what happens, this is environmental theater of a vast scale where the entire town is transformed into various places in the uh, Ram Lila story. Janakpur, where Sita is, Ayodhya, where uh, uh, Ram's capital is, Lanka, as I said, Chitrakut, these are places inside the town. So the Milap takes place in the center. Here, the uh, boys, uh, the Swarups, are illuminated by uh, white uh, flares. At the end of each uh, Lila, there's a ceremony called Arti, which is the temple ceremony. In the temple, the Arti, the camp of flame, and the illumination is done to uh, stone murtis. Uh, here, it's done to living uh, murtis. They, they are the gods at this moment. Uh, people reach out to get uh, uh, prasad, to get a gift from the gods, tulsi leaves that they have touched, and they reach very much to get a hold of them. Uh, when the Leela is not actually uh, uh, taking uh, place or about to take place, uh, people come and reverently uh, wash or touch the feet of the, of the uh, uh, Swarups. Now this picture, black and white, was from the 1920s from the Maharaja's collection. I mean, I took most of the pictures. My son took some and some I've gotten archivally. These old ones are archival. And at that point they used the real Ganga River in the background for the crossing of the Ganga. But after the flood made it uh, unreliable, they now use a, a, a local stream to represent or become the Ramlila, uh, the Ganga at that time. Here you can see a little boy and his father coming to touch the feet of uh, Ram and uh, Lakshman and Sita. Uh, and they are seated here in the Dharamshala. They have just finished their rehearsals. They're in costume. They have their crowns on, so they are the gods they represent, but they have not been yet brought to the place where they're going to perform. They are here in their rehearsal place. And you can see the little boy reaching to touch the feet. The black thread that they're worn across their gold crowns indicate that they are in exile, and we should see them in uh, uh, animal skins and uh, 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 the dress of a sannyasin, of a renouncer, of an ascetic in the, in the forest, not in these fancy clothes. But again, the double reality, because the gods are always resplendent, no matter what they wear. And therefore, we see them in their divine resplendence and the thread reminds us that during the Leela, during the play of it, they are just dressed in the simplest of garb, the loincloth, and almost naked. Here are sadhus who are holy people who come to attend the Ram Leela each year, hundreds of them in olden days, uh, olden days from my point of view in the 70s when I first saw this, now fewer for reasons that we can discuss later. And the man on your left, the old man with his arm up, was called the 150-year-old sadhu. I don't know how old he was, but he was very old. And uh, he would attend each year. He's passed on now into his other existence. Of course, in the Indian cosmology, we don't die as we die. We get recycled. Of course, a, a physicist would agree that there's conservation of energy and conservation of matter is just transformation. The argument is whether we have a self that also gets recycled and, uh, and continues in some other mode, the Indian belief system would say yes, uh, uh, the atheist belief system would say no. These uh, sadhus sing and dance during Ramlila. Here's another one, and he is dressed as Hanuman. So sometimes the, uh, with the uh, red signifies Hanuman, the big war club is Hanuman. 
And the uh, spectators, uh, naming some of them are called, who come very often, they listen and they, uh, they, they listen to the monist being chanted. They also listen to Sambad, which means dialogue, because even the monist is to modern Indian ears what Chaucer uh, would be somewhere between Chaucer and Shakespeare to modern English speakers. So the Samvada is in contemporary, more or less contemporary Hindi from the late uh, middle to late 19th century. There's a whole story about the development of the Samvads and their relationship to Hindu nationalism. Again, I don't have time. Uh, you know, each of these hours could be a whole day as far as I'm concerned. Now here are people watching on elephants. And if you see there's a, a, a white uh, man uh, to the right, that's me. And occasionally I was on an elephant. One of the funny stories is that the old Maharaja the, uh, who, who you see there, the Beauty Narayan Singh, was told me one year I was too old to be on foot. I had to have an elephant. And I said, well, I'm more or less an anthropologist. I have to be with the people. He said, no, uh, you have to have an elephant. You don't fight the king. So I rode one day. But then I said, I don't need the elephant after that. He says, no, the elephant will follow you. So uh, the next day I went out on foot. And the elephant kept after me. And uh, of course, that uh, you can't be anonymous with an elephant there. <laughs> so I started to put children up on the elephant, and he got a little bit pissed. The, the Maharaja said, "Okay, I withdraw the elephant." Uh, here is the Maharaja coming into the city of Benares. One day he comes in to the neighborhood of Nati Imli for the Bharatni lot there in the afternoon, and that's the largest crowd. And it's not even for the Ramnagar Ramlila; it's for one inside uh, of uh, Benares. In the, and it's upwards of 200,000 people come. Here the uh, Maharaja, I've been uh, present for the rule of two Maharajas. This is the beauty Narayan Singh. Later on you'll see his son, Anant Narayan Singh. And he's at the wedding of Ram and Sita. And you see the 150-year-old Sadhu sitting next to him. So the uh, 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 kind of, you know, uh, we don't do that in our political system. We really don't include the... the uh, the, 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 the renouncing uh, beggars as part of our real political system. We sometimes kiss a baby here and there. But this man was very revered, and he's sitting uh, in the honored seat to the uh, right of the Maharaja himself. Uh, uh, when the, uh, the audience participates greatly, so w during the exile of Ram, the beginning, I'm on this elephant, and you can see this long crowd following. So Ram is in front, he's going to exile, and the people go with him. And as they go, uh, they pass through the streets and lanes of Ramnagar, and uh, women and children and men come out and watch what's going on. So that this is an ambulatory environmental theater production. Here is Ravan on your left with his uh, 10 heads and 20 arms, and he's doing battle with Hanuman on your right. At a certain point, Ram's brother Lakshman is wounded, and one of the most moving scenes in Ram, Ram Lila is when Ram laments the wounding of his brother. But this mortal wound is healed when Hanuman brings back an herb from the Himalayan mountains that revives uh, uh, Lakshman. The great day of victory, the Jayadashmi or Dasara day, it's also the day of Durga Puja, it's a great celebratory day in North India, uh, occurs the 10th day of the month. It's kind of interesting to me because in the Jewish tradition, of course, Yom Kippur is the 10th day of the Day of Atonement, the 10th day in the fall, again, uh, I, I see a lot of confluence of, of myths, stories, calendars, and uh, lunar cycles, and so on. The Maharaja comes out, and a great crowd uh, assembles, uh, the largest crowd uh, in Ramnagar, to watch the final battle, the defeat of Ravan and his cremation. And there is Ravan's effigy, uh, the uh, living actor playing Ravan will die, and the effigy awaits, and there is the cremation. Talk about Burning Man, right? So. Uh, He's cremated, and this cremation is his acceptance by Ram, by Vishnu. He surrenders at the end. And one of the great moments in Ram Leela for me is when the uh, Ravan is finally slain, and it's an earlier scene, he comes over and touches Ram's feet and surrender, and then he turns and he starts to the applause, and the audience applauds. So at that point, we have the, the demon defeated by the god, the man touching the god in worship, and the, then the, the performer, the theater person, leading applause at the climactic moment of, of the theater. And all of this coexists in Ramlila. This is the way it was in 1829 when James Princep, who was a, uh, a traveler in Upper India, came to Benares. So we know that they were doing, you can see uh, to your uh, far left, the tall figure 
with the arms, that's Ravan. They had huge effigies and many, many elephants. And Princep was a pretty accurate lithographer, so I don't think he was exaggerating. <coughs> so this is when the Ramnagar, and he identifies as his Ramnagar, Ramlila, had great spectacles. Uh, the Usanvad did not have exist at that time, and we have no evidence that it was 31 days. But certainly this day, the burning, uh, the defeat of Ravan uh, was a very big day back in 1829. This is the way the Bharat Milap uh, looks close up. This is the, Mah or the Vibhuti Narayan Singh. And then there's a ceremony that exists only in Ramnagar called Kotvadai, and that means farewell. At that point, after the Ramlila is over, outside of the Ramchar Manas, outside of the Ramayana Sanskrit tradition, the boys, the Swarups, come to the Maharaja's palace. He arranges to have them fed, and then he performs the Arati himself and says farewell uh, to them. Uh, back in Ayodhya, they come, and the ordinary people come and touch their feet, and they'll have a final, what the Rishik and I call, people's Arati. The Maharaja's out of it uh, at that point, and they go back to Ayodhya, and they have a final Arati, and uh, then, uh, uh, well, that's all I have. I was going to take you back to the Dharamsala, but probably have taken too much time anyway, but that gives some sense of what this magnificent performance is. Thank you. Oh, yes, please. Pretty good summary, I think. <laughs> no, it's all right. I'm just thinking, you know, I've never been under this kind of uh, pressure to uh, uh, congeal myself. I usually am uh, melted. And uh, at this present moment, I'm trying to uh, at least turn to jello, if not to melt. Thank you. Okay, you should uh, shoot. So what my association with his work has been, which spans from 1976 when he first came and visited to 2013 when we both went back to Ramlila, about 40 years of, of continued interaction with the film performance, um, about seven visits, which includes three full 31 days of attending the Ramlila every single day from 5 p.m. Um, sometimes ending at midnight, sometimes going on to the whole night. So this is equal to 10,000 photographs, 200 hours of audio video recordings, several interviews with the royal family, documents, maps, drawings of the environment. So within this huge span of conflate Princess' life, um, conflate Ramila's life, um, and the whole Ramila exists now on um, New York University's um, um, faculty digital archives and now sitting on our stage. So for four years, to sit with this material, to span it out, uh, identify each and every image and say, this is what is going on, has been a very tedious but a very exciting journey. So I'll quickly jump into what my association with, uh, with, uh, with this archive is, with Richard's life is. They want you to have it closer. Uh, Okay. And um, what, what the archive does um, in, in trying to really help both Richard and me and the scholars who will see this identify or lay, lay all these different ears, different performances on a, on a single plane, on a, on a very linear narrative, which Richard just did in 10 minutes. So um, what, what Richard's archive is at point trying to do is to... Um, help all of us engage with this continuous uh, reenactment. Um, what, what it does is that it's not an afterlife of a performance, which most of the archives are. Um, the performance is still going on, so what we can really do is interact with it while there's something happening every single year in Ramnagar. Um, I, I look at this whole collection in uh, three temporalities. One is Richard's own biography. Um, 
as we see his first ever photograph taken in 1978. This is the first time he's ever crossing the river. Uh, we see the fort on the other side. Um, to, the, to the last, um, to, to a picture from his last visit in 2013 <coughs> of, the, of the fort. So already within <coughs> two clicks, we have 40 years and 31 days. Um, and <coughs> Richard realized the magnitude of this performance, which is precisely manifested in the 10,000 photographs and two hours of recordings. And in spite of its vastness, we see how the archives is trying to thread together all these decades of his work. Um, as I said, it's <laughs> a... <laughs> I didn't know about pictures. It's a biographical um, temporal relationship that we are all establishing with the archives. Exactly, Richard doesn't know what he has, and I've tried to pull these pictures out um, to really take the director, Richard Schechner, um, in- That's Dionysus in 69, 69, and the chubby mustache guy is me. And, and that's, that's the, the gods too. watching him. Um, and it's, it's so fascinating to see that in spite of Richard having already done a book on environmental theater, um, there, there, are, there are similarities of space and, wha and what his directorial work is already predicting, uh, what, what Ramlila would do. Um, and onwards is his, his own relation with an encounter with, the, with Banaras, with the, with the time of India. These are his few letters that are in the archives before he goes after his first visit in 1976. He's writing to the Maharaja, seeking permission. Um, this is his first visit in the Royal Fort, his first entry, he's talking to the secretary. Um, and within the archive is also this, this other, other life of Banaras, the other life of the Maharaja. These are documents that the Maharaja is um, signing with the government of India. He's the shortest lived Maharaja. Um, his, he only rules from 11 July till 15th of October in 1947. It's the shortest lived um, rule uh, before India gains independence in um, 1947, but as Richard said, he continues to be the Maharaja um, beyond 1971. He's still called the Maharaja. Uh, he died, um, the Vibhuti Narayan Singh uh, passed away in 2000 and his son has taken over uh, via private ceremony. So Ramlila helps this, this other life of Banaras, this other life of India, which is already living its afterlife, continuously be performed within the 31 days. And all of this gets conflated on the map of um, Ramlila. This is um, a map from 1948 uh, uh, that on, on, on the left gives exactly what's happening for 31 days. So it's a, it's a full itinerary. And on the, uh, on, on the right is the full, full map. Richard, you want to talk about that? Yes, well, oh. here's the fort. You see, that's that. Here's the Ganga River. And then we go down the road and uh, we get way down here to uh, to Lanka at the at the bottom, and you can see this is about uh, this is large. This is like uh, uh, fifteen or twenty square kilometers. And uh, you go down the road, you have uh, Ayodhya, you have uh, Rambagh and uh, Chitrakoot. Uh, oh well, actually Rambagh is is up over here, yeah. and uh, Chitra he was over here, and uh, 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 Janakpur is here. So all of these are places that this is Hanuman bringing back the healing stuff. Uh, here's uh, Lakshman wounded. So the, the program is a map. It's an inherently environmental theater religious belief. Uh, so that this is the chronological 31 days. This is the visual, uh, in uh, Levi Straussian terms, this is synchronic, uh, excuse me, this is synchronic and this is diachronic. This goes through in time and this exists as a, as a continuous present. So once this, the map of the Manas time, of, uh, as I said, of, four, of 14 years from uh, not just Ram's birth, but Ram, the Ramnagar Ramlila actually begins with Ravan's birth. Um, and until he's defeated, and, and you see the little drawing of uh, wounded Lakshman, till, till uh, Ram Rajya is set up and Ram is coronated on the entire map of Ramnagar. So here's Ayodhya, right next to the uh, Maharaja's palace is uh, Ram's palace. Yeah. Um, and so with this 
rigid temporality with, with the pro with conflates with the performance style and into the life of some performers. And I'll quickly talk about the one on the extreme right. Um, he's, this is a photograph from 1978 of a performer who's playing um, a very normal role of a, of a villager um, in, in, the Ram, in, in the Ram Leela performance. I should say here that the four, five boys are selected by the Maharaja, they change each year. Yeah. Sometimes you go from, for a couple of years, once your voice changes, you can't do that. But other roles, and there are a huge panoply of roles, Hanuman, uh, Jambavan, which uh, uh, Rishi is going to talk about, these are passed, uh, Ravan, passed down inside village families yeah. from generation to generation, over dozens of years. The Ravan family has more than 100 years. A Brahma, when I first saw him, he's the eldest god, was played by a 96-year-old man. When I asked him when you first played it, he said, I was 27. So he started as a young man and ended as the old god that he was representing. So those roles are inscribed in the bodies of the villagers around Ramnagar. It's a certain kind of in-depth performance. And the, the roles of the Swarups, of the gods, the most famous ones, they rotate and they uh, roll themselves out. I mean, there's much theory to be made about that, about the temporary endurance of the uh, character roles. In other words, these people die. And the actual permanence of the rotating roles, the uh, Swarups never die because they're only there for a year. They're always young. They never grow old. So we can, uh, we, you know, there's, there's reality within reality. There's a profound performance theory on Act Two. Yes. And spectacular to see that the the five swarups never come from now, Ramnagar. They're always brought from other places. So there's this, again, this question of reality of not having any association with them as boys coming from Ramnagar, but there are these actors who are residents of Ramnagar, and he's playing a villager off, uh, off Ramnagar in, in, within the Ramlila space. Uh, that's a close-up of him. He doesn't look very happy in this minor role. But um, by the time we come to 1997, he's so proudly holding a very major role that he's going to grow into, which is of Jamba One, the only bear who, um, as you know, he sort of is diminished because as we know that Ram is supported by the monkey army, but then there's this bear who, who actually uh, is one of the only characters who are said to be born in all of Vishnu's incarnations. So he's, he's such an important character to have seen all of uh, Vishnu's incarnations and to be in Ramnagar uh, and to be in Ramlila. And uh, he's the one who actually makes Hanuman realize his potential of, of, of being this really strong um, ally that he can be. So this, this is knowledge that he um, contains and it's so wonderful to see him so happy holding that mask um, in 1997 and that's his first role. He's in the center in black as the only bear uh, watching Bali's defeat and, and, and the entire uh, monkey armies is going to uh, agree to give support to Ram. That's Hanuman. Yeah. There are two other bears, Mila and Nara. This is uh, Sugriv, who has uh, just had Ram's help in killing his brother, uh, 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 Bali. And, he, and there's Ram uh, with his bow and arrow in his hand. And this is a good outside uh, view. This is in, uh, uh, is it uh, Kishkinda? No. Uh, and, uh, Yes, it's in it's it's Kishkinda. So, uh, and here, this is the book called the Samvad book. And in there are all the uh, dialogues plus all the stage directions. This is Vyas. He's a priest, but he's a stage director. And so, uh, you know, uh, 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 Reggie book uh, uh, would be very happy, uh, you know, uh, uh, of, of holding the book with all the instructions and all the stage directions and all the dialogues. And they actually, in the Worcester group would be happy because they whisper the mono dialogues into the ears of the performers. It's an in-ear performance, but it's been an in-ear performance long before there were mechanical in-ears to make sure that you don't make any mistakes. And there's 31 days, so you don't have to memorize it. They whisper it, and you can hear it, and then they say it out loud. So that's, that's coming back to Jambavan in, in 1997, straight to 2013, um, as, an, as an old actor still playing this uh, role Amen. for um, 20, almost 20 years. And in 2013, that's him out of costume. Ram's been coronated. Um, this is the, the new Maharaja. The new Maharaja is doing the last, the morning, the early morning 
uh, arti, the final, uh, the final arti of the day, where Ram's everything's over. He's got, he's been coronated. No, not that coke yet. That not will be yeah, later. that'll be later. But this is later. after his coronation. Right, and uh, so Ram Raja has been established in Ramnagar, and uh, Jambawan, who's standing right in the back comes back as, as a citizen both of Ram Rajya, of Ram's rule, and of Ramnagar. So this is sort of... Yeah, crap. so as a, as a very proud citizen of Ramnagar standing right behind a Maharaja, mm -hmm. one in the archive can see his journey as this very minor character in 1978 till 2013, a very prolonged association. And this, this growing old with Ram, with, uh, with Ram Leela and with Richard watching him over the years, something that he wasn't aware of in the 40 years, but the archive actually pulls this relation out. Um, and, and just not this question of temporality, but I'll quickly go through the materials um, of, of, Ramna, of Ramnagar, the effigies, the effigy makers, the role played by um, a man who, uh, who performs Sukhnaka the only time um, a woman comes in in this role I within Ram Leela in 2006 as, as Ravan's sister who wants to, who, who, who's very charmed by Ram, wants to marry him. He sends him to Lakshman, she annoys Lakshman. He chops off his nose uh, and ears and she goes back to Ravan and chops off her nose and ears. Chops off her nose and ears and she goes back to Ravan and tells him of the beauty of Sita and that's where um, uh, Ra Ravan comes to kidnap. So this is a very crucial moment. Um, and this is transformed within minutes into her hideous form after being chopped off, into her effigy after a few minutes. Um, and then the, uh, the afterlife of the effigy of becoming this, this, this you know, transformed from the space of the ritual of theatrical to, to play where children cope with it. Now, um, the, in, in the Ram Leela, uh, <coughs> Muslims play some significant roles. It's a Hindu play, but they are the guiders of the elephants, the mahouts, and they are the makers of all the effigies and the stage props. And so uh, when I ask them, you know, do you believe? Of course they don't believe. And, uh, and, and in Islam, you're not supposed to make images anyway. But it's a good job, and they love the Ramlila. Right. So uh, uh, if you go to Trinidad Ramlila, and Ramlila has been exported all over the world, there uh, Muslims participate in a more believing way. So. You know, this, uh, uh, let's call this uh, Wahhabi Wahhabist uh, Islam is not the mainstream, uh, although we are uh, kind of concerned about it. Uh, uh, and uh, so here's another, oh, that's the brother of, uh, of Ravan. He's a big and fella. And one of the largest effigies, <laughs> and exactly what Richard was saying, is the only time you see Muslim families participating, and yet the women are invisible, they're big, they're not identified as, as spectators, um, but it's the only time women are actually seen at stage hands. Um, making, making, the blue. making the big effigy that we just saw. Um, also interesting is the way um, the props engage. Uh, this, is the, this is the flying chariot that- uh, Pushpaka. Pushpaka that brings uh, Ram to Ayodhya back after his journey of exile. And during the day, um, it's so beautifully integrated into the life of Ramnagar. So within, within this, yeah. this uh, transformation of the life of not just the performers, uh, the researchers, but also the material that, that means so much to the archival oh, okay. um, putting together of this association, and not just the photographs of the performance, but this beautiful mala that sticks in one of the field notes, uh, notebooks. Some, some of my notebooks are out in the lobby there, uh, not this particular one, yeah. but uh, so this is, this so this is, is from to me, 21 September 1978. So it, it actually identifies the date and actually makes Richard present even in the notebook, even in not a picture of the performance, but a mala given to him. E you know, it's withered away and um, a, a beautiful quote from one of the curators at um, MoMA, who I really like, who says that the objects don't need to be uh, you know, they, even in their fragmentation, even in their withering away, they do tell a story. And this photograph that you saw of, um, of the brothers <coughs> meeting this, this end of war, uh, even if it's, if it's uh, abbreviated, um, I don't know what happened in the, in the scanning that happened way before I jumped into the archival collection, but the light actually just falls beautifully on, on the embrace, and that just gets magnified 
Um, and Richard and I and other scholars know who've been there that there are around 30,000 people surrounding this moment that happens at 11 p.m. They've waited from 5 p.m. for just this embrace to happen. And uh, yet in the archive is this very abbreviated, probably technically broken image um, of, of that embrace. So in its spectacular um, putting together um, is coming back to what Richard um, understands of this performance um, of, of his own um, deeds and becoming uh, for 40 years. Yeah. And um, as a part of that remembering and forgetting is my own image that none of us were aware of, uh, of me in 2006, where uh, I don't know, Richard Schechner was there. And uh, three years later, I'm sitting here um, uh, and this and just this this presence this is an evidence of Richard's remembering and forgetting, and um, I would <laughs> just situate it all between this ritual and play, this forty years of interpreting um, this magnificence. Now, some of these pictures, when I'm in them, mm -hmm. were taken by my son. I, you'll hear more about him tonight, but I uh, brought him to India for his first trip, and he was my uh, uh, backpack bearer and uh, sometime photographer. Uh, in what was it, 1997? And uh, uh, obviously I'm here with the uh, uh, demon army and Ram's army and the little Hanuman and uh, we're in Lanka and uh, well that's me, obviously. Thank you. Thank you. Now you have some questions for me. I'm gonna stand up because I like to answer questions. Okay. Often. I've always um, been a peripatetic teacher. Okay, well, it's all right, it's all right. It's not my penis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have about 10 minutes. All right. Okay, so I'll quickly um, ask Richard, why are we beginning with Ramlila? What? Why are we beginning? Why, why are we beginning, beginning with Ramlila? Ram because in terms of my active, and I'll do this briefly because there are other things, but my active participation in uh, theater, when I first saw Ramlila, I actually first saw it in 1976, I first saw the whole thing in 78, but I saw a few days in 76. Uh, I saw in Ramlila a convergence between environmental theater as I practiced it and derived it largely from uh, uh, Grotowski and Meyerholtz and the European tradition and something already full-blown environmental theater realized in this uh, make-belief make -belief, uh, performance in India. And it was a thrill to see that kind of Convergence. Uh, I am certain that the Maharaja Banaras had not been studying Okopkov and Meyerholtz and uh, so on and so forth and uh, Grotowski. Uh, it's more likely that Okopkov and uh, Grotowski, Grotowski certainly made a trip to India. But to see these, uh, this convergence, so I figured it was really a, uh, a good thing to start with. And also, in the terms of my scholarly adventure, it's the longest arch of continuous, uh, coherent investigation. Of course, I've been interested in theater since I was in high school. But, uh, but this is a particular thing that I return to again and again and again. And 2013 is the last time, uh, most recent time, but I'm sure I will be back again. Um, so how do we get so big, the Ramlila? Well, the Ramlila, again, I have to give these like uh, telegraphic answers. <laughs> and uh, we're working on our book together, which will be primary documents, photographs, and interviews and notebook entries, but I'm also going to do a monograph where I'll explore the uh, theoretical uh, implications. The telegraph answer is that the uh, Conga River bends at uh, Benares, and in order to control uh, uh, trade and military operations, you have to have a, uh, a military outpost at the bend, and it's best to have it across the river uh, from the main uh, uh, Benares or Varanasi in the town of Ramnagar is a good place to have it. So the Maharaja, who is actually a late coming Maharaja, in other words, not only is he uh, in the 47, but he's an 18th century, he doesn't have a huge uh, inheritance. It was a Maharaja that was purchased uh, for his son by a, uh, uh, a, land, a landlord. So the, the, the family line doesn't go back that far. Established the fort there. But the fort was on the wrong side of the river. There's a right side of the river, which is where Benares is, and there's a wrong side of the river where people go to do their morning toilet and so on. It's, it's not the right side. Uh, uh, Ramnagar is on the wrong side. 
So to bring some glory and reputation to it, to establish it, to bring people over to it, he uh, instigated, I believe, he instigated this great festival. And that draw thousands of people from the 19th century across from shortly after establishing this kila, which is the uh, uh, Mughal word uh, for fort, this fort, this palace. So it's there for strategic reasons, for political reasons, for uh, ritual, uh, to, to establish the ritual on the, right side, uh, on the wrong side of the river and, uh, and making it the right side of the river because the Maharaja has endorsed it. Um, so, Richard, having known both Banaras, Varanasi, or Kashi from 1926 to 1930, does, did, the, did the place change for you and how they fashioned it? Yes, well, the, those, those words signify different uh, things for the same city. Like we call New York Gotham, we call it the city, we call it New York, you know. These things have a different uh, resonance. So Kashi is the oldest name. I mean, uh, Diane Eck has wrote, written a great uh, book called City of Light where she goes into this in some detail and she's the real expert on the history of this place, the uh, expert in England. But Kashi is the ancient name for it and, it, and it's a city probably the longest continuously inhabited a city in the world. In other words, there are older cities, of course, but they're wrecks. You know, I mean, you can't go to Mohanjadaro, you'll see a, an art, a, you know, or, or Stonehenge or whatever. But people have been living in Benares for at least 3,000 years, and uh, we have records of it. So, uh, uh, and Kashi is the ancient uh, name of, the, of this uh, ancient uh, kingdom. Uh, and then when the Buddhists uh, came uh, and Buddha did his first. Uh, uh, his, his, his sermons in Sarnak, which are near to Benares, and you'll have a lot of Japanese tourists, for example, coming to Varanasi to go to Sarnak. He, Buddha lived around 500 BC, about the same time that the uh, Greek tragedians were working. And he, he his name, uh, the Buddhist name is Benares. And, and so it still has that kind of Buddhistic. Uh, Buddha was a, uh, a reformist Hindu, right? Buddhism is a, Buddhism is to Hinduism roughly what uh, Christianity is to Judaism, and uh, uh, the Hindus rejected Buddhism, but it, it is an outgrowth uh, uh, of it. And then the modern, uh, more modern city, Varanasi, and it's got its name from various things, from the Varuna River and the Asi River, the thing between them, whatever. Uh, that represents both the colonial and post-colonial and independent Indian. So these things are all uh, function uh, si simultaneously. And uh, the uh, part of, uh, of Varanasi right next to the river changed, has changed very little. And I have photographs and lithographs from the 19th century, photographs from my window uh, and it shows the same kind of boats. That's changed very little because the river itself is a constantly self-renewing sacred thing with the burning ghats, with the, uh, uh, a very powerful uh, 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 riverside uh, uh, places, the Asi Ghat, where we live, Ghat means the uh, banks of, of the river. That has changed, but inside the, the uh, city there's been an e enormous change. It's uh, doubled in population at least. Uh, uh, it's industrialized, it's messy, it's dirty, it's fabulous. Uh, people come to Benares and Varanasi, a lot of people come to die there because to die there is to immediately g achieve moksha, release, to uh, be ex absorbed. So actually you can come there and do any sin you want because you're immediately forgiven if you <laughs> manage to die there. So it attracts a lot of uh, uh, good time seekers at the end of their life. It's a paradox that way. Uh, so the city has, from my point of view, both changed uh, uh, internally as modernized and so on, but remained the same along the banks of the river. And does the Ramlila also respond Well, the to Ramlila that? Uh, uh, changes, it doesn't change. Let's say the Ramlila, like a, any great performance, it has its consistency as an enactment, but its meaning, its semiotic change. So as the uh, rise of the BJP, B, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the radical Hindu uh, political party, which now uh, rules uh, India, and it's more, even more radical out offshoots like the Shiv Sen and things of this sort, as, uh, and as after the destruction of the mosque in 1992 in Ayodhya, which is about 150 miles from Benares, not the Ayodhya in Ramlila, but the quote real Ayodhya, uh, uh, there's been a surge of, of Hindu nationalism. And Ram, 
who at the beginning in the 19th century of the Ramlila was a cultural hero, asserting the independence of India from the Mughals on the one hand and the British on the other. And then in Gandhi's time, he was a unifier. Ram should belong to I Islam, it should belong to Hindu, it should belong to Christianity, it should belong to all the world, and Ram should unify. And now Ram is a nationalist, Hindu nationalist figure. So the same gestures mean differently within changing political context. Um, you talked about the multiple texts. Um, yes. And what is, where so does the story sit and what's your relation with all these narratives? Well, there is the ghost text of Valmiki's Ramayan. Now, Valmiki's Ramayan is the Sanskrit epic uh, roughly 2,000 years uh, ago. Uh, and uh, it tells the story of Ram. But in the Ramayan, Ram is a, quote, a man. We know he's a god, but he doesn't know he's a god. He is a hero, and, and so the poet knows uh, what the uh, character doesn't know. By the Ram Shart Manas, which is uh, 15 centuries later, everyone knows he's a god. So that's the text. We don't hear the Ramayana, but it supplies the basic narrative. The text we hear is the Manas, in which Ram knows he is the uh, incarnation of Vishnu. Everyone knows he's the incarnation. The audience knows, the characters know, Ravan knows, everyone knows. And, and therefore, it, it, uh, this text, as it's chanted, is a kind of ongoing lit liturgical text. At the same time, the Samvad, which is the recitation of dialogue and interactions, is a dramatic text. So that's in modern Hindi. Now, I said I would say a little bit about it. The, one of the men who formed it was a man named Harish Chandra, Bharatendu Harish Chandra. Now, he's called the father of modern Hindi. And he had a slogan, which is Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan. Mm -hmm. And this is the rise of uh, Indian nationalism in the 19th century. And he said, look, uh, very simple. The England is the place where English is spoken. France is the place where French is spoken. Germany is the place where German is spoken. But we don't have any language, real language. We have this kind of street uh, language, Braj and so on, dialect of Hindi at that time. We have the Mughal language, uh, uh, Urdu, and that was the language of the Mughal rulers who came in with Genghis Khan's children, right? The Mughal, uh, and we have the English, but he said we must have our own language, Hindi. And he coined, or he and his friends coined the term. And he began, he was a journalist, and he began writing Hindi and speaking it. So he collaborated with the Maharaja in making these Sambhad. So now Ram the God speaks Hindi. <laughs> you see? He's not speaking Sanskrit. He's not speaking uh, Urdu. He's speaking Hindi, a new language, or a reformed language out of existing dialects. And, and he is the Hindu god Ram Raj, the great king. He, he is the memory of, uh, of the great king. So here's the great king speaking the language. So now we have... Hindu, Hindi, therefore a proposed Hindustan. And, and so that text then establishes at a cultural level independent India. And, uh, and, and Ram is uh, put into that so that we have that. And then the final, uh, uh, well final, but the, the next layer of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, semi of text is the uh, gestural uh, layer of the uh, uh, the the ritual layers of the ceremonies, of the arti, of the darshan, the, the view of the gods, all of the temple services, the prasad, these kind of things constitute a very, very well-known and believed in uh, uh, religious practice. So that's also a, uh, a, a kind of text. I think we're running out of time. I can see the, uh, yeah. the timekeeper well, here. As you said, you know, you put, it took an entire day and an entire week. Entire life. You spent 40 years on it. I think it, it gives us an insight and it's inspired us to look deeper and that we're all looking forward. So, so thank you uh, so much for coming and uh, thank you very much. And, uh, Do we have a little bit of a break? Yeah. No, I think we're going to go uh, right away uh, to, to Richard uh, Schechner, the director. And uh, we have now Marvin with us. Oh boy. <laughs> I, I'll have a glass of water. Okay. And, uh, So now I want to, Brad, I'm going to show those slides. I think I should do it through my computer again. Do I need to? No, uh, yeah, it, it is one over here. Oh, no, there is one right now. Right. Okay. So now 
I'll fix it. So, because later on, I'll need to plug it in. <laughs> no. Oh, good. So, um, Richard Schechner, the director. Okay. Are you? Marvin, I'm honored. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, it's uh, a, a, a great honor uh, to be here this morning and be participating in this, this wonderful event uh, in honor of the individual who I think indisputably has had more of an impact on the theater nationally and internationally than anybody else I can think of uh, th th that's currently living anyway. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the particular aspect of Richard's work that we're going to be talking about for the next couple of hours is his directing and the, uh, uh, the, the part of the program that you just had, obviously as Richard mentioned himself, connects to that in a number of interesting ways, uh, and, and maybe we'll have a chance to explore some of those as well. Uh, when I first started uh, uh, getting really interested in the theater back in the late 50s and during the 60s, uh, I saw Richard Schechter everywhere, sometimes literally, uh, but certainly figuratively. Uh, the uh, uh, the work of the of, of TBR, which he then was editing, was really the Bible for anybody in theater that was interested nationally and internationally in what was going on, what were the new movements, what were the new ideas, what were the what were the theorists and, and practitioners we should be interested in. And uh, one of the remarkable things about Richard from the very beginning was that in addition to pointing out um, people, productions, and movements that we, we should know more about and, and that would be useful and influential to all of us. Richard was also a very important practitioner. He was doing things uh, and, and uh, putting, uh, putting uh, work into practice, uh, pushing out in new directions, uh, and stimulating us as much by his, his practice as by his writing. Uh, what we're going to be talking about in the next couple of hours is primarily the practice, although obviously the, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's all of a piece, and I hope we can talk a little bit about that as we discuss it. So that's my introduction, and we're going to now go to, some, uh, to a short uh, slideshow, and then Richard and I will enter into dialogue. Okay, so again, there's never enough time. I've been directing plays. Uh, for a long time. Uh, I think, Brad, uh, the best thing is for me to uh, uh, run it from here. Uh, slideshow. And then uh, when we get to the film clips, should I run them from here or should we run them from you? I can't hear you. Okay, good. So uh, this is going to be a quick run through. So let's take the lights down and Turn, turn the lights up. Okay. Now, uh, I'm just going to give brief sketches so you can get some sense of uh, 50 years of directing, more or less. So this is 1967. This is the Victims of Duty. It's New Orleans, Louisiana. It's the first thing designed by Jerry Rojo, who is a student of mine. It's obviously environmental theater. Uh, it's uh, Eugène Ionesco's Victim de Devoir, Victims of Duty, and I did my dissertation about Ionesco. This is another scene from that play, and that's Arthur Wagner recently passed away, professor of the theater and a colleague of mine at uh, Tulane at that point. Uh, and uh, that motorcycle is ridden into the center of the performance from outside. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff I could say about each of these. The next set of slides are, uh, are Dionysus and 69. I'm going to introduce them and not say anything, just give them to you. It's so well known that if you don't know it, don't embarrass yourself by saying you don't know it. Just go online, the film is there, and so on. But I want to give a panoply of the performing garage, Dionysus and 69. You're going to see 
first the birth ritual, then a little bit of the ecstasy dance, then the famous first uh, kiss between two men uh, full on the mouth in the New York theater when uh, uh, Pentheus and uh, Dionysus, uh, Dionysus seduces Pentheus, and the sacrifice of Pentheus uh, uh, and the dismemberment of his body, and finally the performance ending in the street. Uh, the play is based on the Baki. If you go outside and see my notebooks, you'll see a letter that I wrote from Fort Hood, Louisiana, when I was in the Army in 1958. I had forgotten about that letter, actually, 1957, to Monroe Littman, who was the chair of the theater department at Tulane at that point. I was in the Army. I was not there. Saying to him, look, I think I want to come to Tulane and go to school, and I am interested in this play, The Baki. Maybe I'll submit an essay to TDR about it. Uh, Robert Cargan was editing TDR at that time. Indeed, I did submit that essay. It was my first scholarly essay ever published anywhere. And it's kind of ironic that it turned out to be the Baki young king sacrificed to a jealous god. And then I made this play based on the Baki. So now let's look at Dionysus. A very sensuous production to say the least. This is the spectators. Most of those people are spectators. There's Pentheus sending everybody back home. There they are grabbing their clothes and going back home. Dionysus and uh, Pentheus kissing. Performer on your left, spectator on your right. Spectators and performers mixed in a what we call the total caress. Pentheus finally coming, giving over to Dionysus truly and coming out to doing his dances. Now in the film, they're never naked because we wanted to get a good rating and have it commercially, Brian De Palma and I. But in the theater, it was, uh, there was a lot of nakedness and, and it, it intensified it. If I had to make that film over again, I would say forget about the day. I mean, I didn't know what was gonna happen 20 years later that this kind of thing would have been show showable. But anyway, Dionysus marking Pentheus. Agave coming and caressing him. There's two agaves, a nice, interesting personal story. The one on the, uh, your right, no, excuse me, the one on your left is Joan McIntosh. The one on your right is uh, uh, Priscilla Smith, uh, Seal Smith. Uh, they were, uh, I was living with Joan at the time. We later married and later after that divorced. But uh, uh, she wanted to play agave. And she says, you know, I'm the best actress. Uh, Priscilla Seal came to me and she said, you will give that role to her because you're living with her and you, you always are privileging her. You know I'm the best actress. I finally said, I'm so fucking tired of both of you. You both play the role simultaneously at the same time, and you make out of it whatever you can. And then uh, uh, Dionysus in his final curse says, and to you, Joan, as you see in the movie and seal, I pronounce this uh, doom. You're uh, doomed to live out the rest of your wretched lives never knowing which of you played agave. So uh, <laughs> that's... That's the director's revenge at rebellious uh, actors. Sometimes, rather than choosing, let them fight it out. So the death ritual now. The reverse of the birth ritual with those bloody hands. And Brian uh, took this notion of the bloody hand and used it in Carrie. Vietnam. There's a period of Vietnam. Dionysus cursing them all, and then the move into the streets of New York. At about the same time, the Living Theater was doing similar things with Paradise Now. Actually, it was, uh, yeah, about the same time. All right, now the next set of pictures, I'm, I'm giving you in advance so I don't have to waste the time talking, is of Macbeth. Now remember these first pictures, performance group uh, pictures, not the, not the first two, which was in New Orleans, but this next set, I'm concentrating on my earlier work, were all done in the performing garage. And unless otherwise noted, the uh, environments were designed by Jerry Rojo in consultation with me. Jerry's still alive. He teaches a unit. He taught at the University of Connecticut. Uh, and the way we worked is I conceived of the set, and he uh, did the physical uh, design and uh, construction uh, uh, of them, the technical drawings. But the, the ideas, I, I have to say, uh, immodestly were my ideas. So with, uh, with uh, Macbeth, I wanted the table, the banquet table. And the, uh, the uh, uh, 
three witches that were dark powers, and they were not only the witches, but they were all of the lower class characters, and they inherit this. And out there in the table is my version of those dice. This is with a K. Uh, my rule for myself in making the text was I had to use words that were in the original, but I didn't have to use them in the order they were given. So I followed the basic uh, 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 script, but and it has this feeling of Shakespeare because I could not use the word that was in there. But I retold the story in my own way. There's Macbeth selecting uh, two of the dark powers to kill Banquo. Banquo is played by a woman. There's uh, Macbeth at his banquet, but he's being eaten by the three powers, by the, uh, the, the witches. Uh, there is Macduff and Malcolm uh, plotting their vengeance, and there's Richard Schechner with uh, notebooks, and you'll see many of those notebooks out there. I would always take notes and deliver them to the actors. And there's the final scene, Steve Borth giving to, uh, and Macduff, uh, Macduff giving the crown to Malcolm, Steve Borth giving it to um, uh, Will, uh, Shepherd, William Shepherd. Next performance is called Commune, same space, and it's called Several Well-Known uh, 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 Scenes Enacted by the Youth of Our Nation. And what it was was the Vietnam War, the My Lai Massacre especially, and the killings of Sharon Tate and her uh, friends by uh, Charles Manson. And uh, to do research for this particular production, I went and joined temporarily a commune in Boston. They wanted me to stay there, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, similar to the Manson kind of thing, and they weren't murdering people, at least not while I was there. But they were. It was a pretty, it was a pretty heavy-duty kind of thing to get a sense of that interiority. So the uh, conceit of the play is: How would Charles Manson tell the history of the United States and incorporate into it the Vietnam War? And uh, uh, we uh, to get into that performance, you had to uh, take off your shoes. You let no one in who had their shoes, and the shoes stayed by the entrance way. And then the performers used those shoes when they were the murder. We also stole the actor, the spectators' uh, uh, coats and scarves when we could, and we costumed ourselves in their clothes, which we stole because Manson said, we creep and crawl into people's houses and take things that belong to us because everything belongs to everybody. He was a kind of uh, insane, murderous, idealist, uh, utopian communist. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I was very affected by uh, you know the book, The Family, and, and what I learned about Manson and Sweetie Frome and the rest of them. And, and then we reenacted that murder as well as uh, integrated texts from uh, Thoreau and uh, Emerson and Melville and uh, uh, Shakespeare's King Lear and Richard III and Edward II. I, and I, I assembled the, the, the texts all about com communal things. It was the first time uh, Spalding Gray had made a cameo appearance earlier, but this was the first time that he had a major role. So the, there is that same space as uh, configured in commune. There's Spawn and Gray as a, as a uh, coyote, and those other two people are spectators. There's another person up above as a, another <coughs> coyote, because it takes place in the desert. And you can see the chalk. Uh, uh, when the people came in, they took off their shoes, but they were given chalk, and they could do graffiti wherever they wanted all over it. Now there, you can see Joan McIntosh at the end of the pool there, and she's wearing a coat that she took from some spectator. The idea was to take it, and the spectator would not know that they were taking it. And here they are on the creepy crawly mission going in to do the uh, killings. And you can see they have shoes on the shoes of the spectator's shoes. Uh, and here they are uh, killing, and the people in the center represent the villagers of Beli. There was a scene in the play where we selected 15 people from the audience randomly to come down and represent the villagers of Beli, and then these killings were going on around them, as well as we interviewing them, or uh, giving the testimony about the slaughter at Beli. If somebody refused to come down, we would say, let's say Joe Roach over here refused to come down. I said, well, you have a choice. You can select uh, somebody in the room to come down for you, and if they come down for you, fine. Or you can go home, uh, uh, fine. Or if you stay and you don't select, we're not going on with the performance. We will not go on with the performance till either you go home or we have 15 people. And occasionally it lasted two, three hours, the standoff. But once you play the rules of the game, you play the rules of the game. Um, so here's that. And then finally, uh, and this is uh, the man in the multicolored uh, costume in the center lower is Spalding. And he ends the play with this uh, statement, uh, 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 what's the role of the artist in today's society? And his answer is yes, yes. And then 
the play fades and people have to go and find their property and their shoes and so on. Now I want to run the film clip from uh, Tooth of Crime. That's the next play I did. I don't have videos from it, but I want to run a little film clip from Sam Shepard's Tooth of Crime. I did the uh, uh, American premiere. So let's get this out of here and get the picture on. Hey, let's have the picture. Same space. Take the lights down, please. A little, a little louder, too. That's falling gray of Haas. So it was done for a film, and it was done as a film in a kind of Hollywood studio. John McIntosh is Becky Lou. And the audience could move around anywhere in this space. And you can Why see these are all spectators there. Yeah. They could go up Why above, yeah. they could hang around. It was very close, as though they were on a set of a uh, film. And we did film it. And as you can see, the way we spoke was kind of movie talk. In other words, not loud. See her and the spectator. Rolling nightclubs, busting up poker games, strip joints, zip guns, junkyards, rock pipes, dirt pipes, busting windows. I always wanted the intimacy of the spectator and the performance together. I mean, even this room is distasteful to me to some degree. There's no other way to do it, but you know what I mean. I'd rather sit in a circle and work with you. Hey, stop, man. Okay, move it forward a little bit. I want to go to that song. Just move it. Keep moving. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. What do you think about? Yeah, that right there. That, no, no. Give me a I need some tape for my No, go forward. It's not. Are you crazy? No, forward. Are you crazy? No, I'm serious. I need some peace. I'm getting too old for this sport. You know what it's like out there, outside the game. You wouldn't recognize it. What about New York? Second Avenue? What New York? What Second Avenue? There ain't no Second Avenue. The law comes out. You would have never. Snowball can't tell anything about outside the game. Aren't you too professional? You won't be careful. Okay, let's stop. I wanted to go on to another song, but we don't have enough time. But you can get the idea. So I integrated music into the performance. Uh, uh, Sam Shepard was never happy with this because I didn't follow his stage directions. 
<laughs> and, he, uh, and I said, stage directions are for history, not for directors. Uh, and, uh, and I wouldn't uh, take his advice about music. I wanted to make music from old car parts, uh, integral. Uh, but, uh, so that was that. Okay. Uh, the next is Mother Courage. We did it during the recession. The, what happened? Hello? I, I need that. There he is. So this was the program. Uh, beat Mother Courage's winter clearance. That's Ron Vorder. During the crunch, your best bet is with Mother Courage. It's saving discounts. Each night, we gave a 19 cents off, 18 cents, production of the performance group, uh, for touring, group rate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Complete dinner, $1.99. So I wanted to take the commerce idea of Mother Courage and also not to have her in some German mythical war in the 16th century, but right here in the United States at this time. Although we didn't change the text. I stuck very close to the Mannheim text. It still referred to the Thirty Years' War where the play is set, but the reference, you'll see the visual reference is much different. So this is the beginning. We didn't have a wagon. I decided that the way to do Mother Courage uh, in my own way was to reject the wagon. Once I have a wagon, I'm imitating the model books. And I'm not interested ever in imitating any other director. I only want to steal occasionally, but never imitate. <laughs> so, uh, and when we talk about surrogation and restoration of behavior, we can talk about the difference between theft and uh, imitation and my nature. At any rate, to the right there is uh, uh, Elizabeth LeCompte, who played several roles in it, and she was also in Puget Time. This is Jim Clayburgh, who designed the set, Joan McIntosh, playing Courage, Leany Sack as Katrine and uh, Spalding Gray as Swiss cheese. And you can see it's the same space, how the audience is uh, uh, packed in. And instead of the wagon, we had these ropes and uh, pulleys. And the whole room became Mother Courage's wagon. So here at the first scene, uh, uh, he's the horse pulling the wagon. And here's Kutch uh, Courage negotiating with the sergeant. Everybody played multiple roles. Here's uh, Isla singing to the general. The uh, general is uh, played by Liz LeCompte, and we did her as a Vietnamese, uh, South Vietnamese general. We modeled it. And this is up in the corner of the garage. So this is the famous scene three, when Swiss cheese loses the cash box, throws it away. Here's Courage. Here's uh, Yvette, the prostitute. There's the prostitute's home, you know, where she does her business. This is uh, uh, Katrine. And here's the home base of the wagon. You can again see we had a couple of hundred people. It's very successful production. And we left these marks on the floor so we could, uh, or the idea was not to hide in any sense. That's very Brechtian, hide what we were doing. We did, when, when we put a spike on the floor, as they say in theater, we left it very, very uh, visible. So here's that scene. Uh, Katrina's running off with the red boots. Uh, Spalding, uh, Swiss cheese as a Boy Scout is trying to hide the cash box. The soldiers are coming to do uh, sex with the Yvette. Courage is uh, uh, getting some shit to rub on Katrine's face so she wouldn't be uh, raped, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, but uh, uh, Swiss cheese is caught and he's put up in a halter. Yvette is watching. Courage doesn't know what to do and his life literally hangs in the balance. And then we play the song uh, of the hours there, and we hauled out the uh, musicians as uh, uh, his life hangs in the balance. And uh, uh, again, I was always using these things. Now the lights are much into the set, as you can see, and the pulleys. So the, the notion was to build the theater, the history, the Americanness of it in uh, Swiss Jesus shot. And you can see carriage. And then we did this in India as well. And this is the uh, same scene. Uh, the silent scream of Helene Weigel, very famous. And that one we did uh, imitate or steal uh, uh, because courage can't make any noise, but she can have the expression of it. And these are all Indian, uh, 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 Indian. I think this was the, from the Calcutta production. Courage goes and looks and has to deny that she knows. Then we served the supper to the uh, audience. It was a four hour performance where no intermission. We really did serve them uh, supper. During the, uh, during the performance, and we did scene uh, four, the uh, song, The Great Capitulation, uh, during the supper as a cabaret song. And then shortly thereafter, we went out into the streets. This is the performing garage. That sign is still there. There's the performing garage sign that says Mother Courage. 
There's uh, Katrine, it's snow on the ground, it's cold. It very, got very cold in the wintertime. When we did that, this door of the garage remained open for the rest of the performance. Again, I've, I've w always wanted to challenge uh, uh, spectators. They can uh, get cold or get hot, they can do this or that, that. I don't believe in coddling them. So we'll steal their clothes and commune, we'll make it cold in Mother Courage. Whatever happens, happens, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, Katrine is uh, uh, killed. Courage strips her down to her underwear so she can sell the clothes. Courage is always selling things. She pays the peasant woman for the burial. It's paid by Le Camp. Courage gathers up all of the ropes. She's like a, a woman, a spider caught in her own web. And she goes off where everybody is in the pit. All the dead are in the pit. You can see the uh, spectators in their coats. It's very cold. And she says, wait for me. So that's Mother Courage. Next is Marilyn Project. The same time we did, this is upstairs at the garage. So we sometimes had six hour performances. We did four hours of Mother Courage and we went upstairs and did the Marilyn Project. And it was a, a play by David Gard. Marilyn Monroe was played by Joan McIntosh and Elizabeth LeCompte. People don't know Elizabeth's uh, long uh, acting history with me. She acted in a number of performances. Truth of Crime, Mother Courage, Marilyn Project, uh, 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 Cops, you, so you'll see her. So. Uh, this is Liz, and this is Joan McIntosh. Now, this performance was a complete replication of itself. This is the dividing line. This television screen shows what happens on this side, this one on this side, and this is the one of the few times they see each other. The performance was two simultaneous performances going on at the same time, mirror images of, of themselves. The reason this occurred, actually, was not some brilliant stroke of mine. I did this as a workshop production at American University of Washington. There were too many students who said, fuck it, we'll just double cast it. And I didn't want to meet them twice, so you'll come to the same rehearsals. You'll be on this side of the room, you'll be on this side of the room. But it was, it was one of those accidents that really worked very well because of Marilyn's image as a, as a media image. So it, it became uh, this kind of thing. So you can see that there's this, there's that, and uh, there's this guy, and there's that. Uh, everything is doubled, and Ron Border is one of the directors, and then these are spectators. This was the only production of mine that uh, Lee Strasberg ever saw. There is uh, 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 Elizabeth LeCompte, there's Joan McIntosh, there's the scene that they're trying to shoot in the movie. They want her to bend down like that so they can get a sh uh, shot of her butt. She finally does it, but she doesn't like doing it. And uh, they have to coach her, and now, of course, there's an understudy, and uh, the understudy is doing it, and they're talking to the real Marilyn to get her doing it. Here's the understudy. You see there's uh, everything. So it was, it took, when I finally did it professionally, it really took the exact dance position because all the dialogue was spoken. So you couldn't have it blurry. It had to be exact. Then they get a massage. And then finally, they pose the two uh, men, the gaffers, the, uh, in the famous uh, Marilyn calendar pose. But I didn't want to have a, ma a woman pose in it. I wanted to throw that back, so we had a man, two men do that, and the uh, two Marilyns took their Polaroid pictures and they got up, we left the Polaroid shot and spectators could do that. Next performance downstairs in the garage, same time, was of Seneca's Oedipus. Now Seneca's rather than, uh, uh, rather than uh, 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 Sophocles. And there I built, uh, Rojo built for me, a, 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 a Roman amphitheater and 27 tons of dirt. We had to have dump trucks come. They were three and a half feet deep and we dug into that dirt, not just a little bit, but this, this far from the floor. And there is uh, uh, Joan McIntosh as uh, Yocasta. And I always thought of Yocasta constantly being pregnant. After Oedipus arrives, she has four children right away and he's been gone at least 18 years, so uh, something like that. So obviously she's eager. Now we took this, uh, uh, body mask when Joan was eight months pregnant with our son Sam. So it was, uh, an, it was a, a very uh, a personal performance. It was also at the end of our marriage. So it was uh, doubly personal. And the audience again is very, very uh, close in. Uh, there's Oedipus, uh, Steve Borst, uh, Creon, and Tiresias played by a woman. And we use masks that we cast from our own face. So she's blind, so she has the hands over her eyes, and Oedipus will finally have the hands over his eyes. And then the uh, uh, Tiresias is buried in this earth, and it was very frightening for the actress because all that's left is this and her head, and she's got this earth, and then she starts to prophesy, and the whole room vibrates because it's coming from under the earth. And then the, her assistant 
uh, drops down into the earth. And then Oedipus uh, embraces uh, uh, Yocasta, they really know. And then we speak the lines, uh, the shepherd and the messenger, but these masks we cast from our own faces. So uh, this is his newly sacked uh, face, and this is the messenger's face. I, like, I always like this with the spectator behind. And Oedipus interrogating the uh, uh, shepherd. Then this uh, strange scene where the messenger crosses with a trombone. Why? Because the actor playing it had a, played the trombone. And I wanted a pause. And I always, uh, Brecht once said, you want to build a house, use the bricks that are there. So I uh, said, let's play the trombone at this moment. And he drew it. I also used a great drum that I brought back from India from Chow dancing as a vibrating great drum called a dorm drum. Oedipus himself buries his face and comes up knowing who he is. The messenger described the earth being the blood, throwing it up, how Oedipus blinded himself. And this was a very hard scene because the earth comes down over his face like that. Uh, uh, and then uh, Yocasta comes. Oedipus is standing there, naked, drenched in blood, his own mud, his own uh, hand blanking out the mask of his face. She touches him, his penis, and says, this is where it started right here. They laugh. They laugh. It's an absurd kind of thing. And then she digs up and finds the spear with which Oedipus killed Laius, plunges it into her pregnant belly, and dies. Uh, it was probably the harshest uh, performance I've ever done. Now, I want to run the uh, Yocasta's clip, the very, very beginning. I return to the Yocasta theme. I'm not going to play very much of this, but I want you to see what I did with Yocasta's, my own version, uh, co-authored with Staviana Stanescu, who's teaching uh, playwriting at uh, Ithaca College now with my colleague. And so this is, turn down the lights and let's have the beginning of Yocasta's. It's about Yocasta, four Yocastas, four times of her life. But this is just the very, very beginning. I want to show only a few minutes. So there you can see Yocasta's Redux, 2005. I wasn't wanting to show all this, but it's okay. Why not give them their credit? You can see I, I was with it. Yeah. And now Benjamin and Moss and I have been working together since this time. So this is the very beginning. A little louder, please. My copy of the book.
Okay, enough. Could you talk about that? Okay. So what I did in that performance then, she's joined by three other yokasas. Uh, one who's eight years old, one who's the one who gives away uh, Oedipus at uh, her birth, and the perfect one, Yono, who lives with Oedipus and enjoys him for those 14 years. Uh, th that video is available. They said I could uh, turn these down a little bit, just a little bit, so we can see this. That's good. They said I couldn't do naturalism, so the next thing I did was realistic. Uh, hyper realistic. So this is called Cops by Terry Curtis Fox. Uh, uh, obtained a space next to the performing garage. That's Elizabeth LeCompte as the waitress. That's Willem Dafoe as the cook. You can see where the spectators are. The spectators are also in the sp spot where the uh, camera is. And uh, it also had Spalding Gray, Steve Borst, uh, Tim Shelton. Uh, and it's a, a cop story, a shootout story. And uh, I uh, actually purchased a a, uh, an abandoned diner and brought the fixtures in and set it up and we had a real phone, we had a real working stove, etc. And it's, a, uh, you know, everybody gets shot uh, <laughs> and the, the, co the uh, uh, thief holds the uh, cook hostage but finally the uh, cops, uh, uh, the cops shoot him. Okay, that's the end of that one. So I, I never returned to that kind of hyper-realism again but uh, under duress, I would. Uh, th the next is uh, a Faust Gastronome, where Faust is a cook. I was going to show you a uh, film clip, but I won't. We're running way late in time, and there's one more film clip I want to show. So this is uh, uh, Mephistopheles, played by a woman. Mephistopheles' assistant, played by a German woman, Ulla Neuerberg, who uh, spoke uh, uh, German, and uh, uh, Faust uh, uh, there, as I say, is a cook. So. Uh, here's uh, uh, Mephistopheles <laughs> interviewing Faust. Her tale had a kind of a, a, a penis ending, as you can see. Uh, and uh, there it is, the uh, uh, contract in blood, Faust getting what he wants, he uh, dances with cows, uh, and finally he's th thrown into a huge pot of uh, marinara sauce, uh, <laughs> as his uh, comeuppance. Uh, next one, very quickly, is Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, the first African-American play ever done in South Africa, and uh, the first uh, fully integrated performance at a major South African festival. I was very proud to have the African National Congress behind me, and uh, uh, the uh, Grahamstown Festival, the Grahamstown Memorial, uh, agreed to my request that the audience be integrated. The cast uh, was uh, an integrated cast, and it was environmental theater. There is the... Uh, uh, 1980 something or other. I have to look at my CV, but around 84, 85, something like that. Uh, so that's Ma Rainey's, uh, that's the recording studio, that's where <coughs> the producers are, and that's where the uh, uh, band rehearsals. So there's three spaces in this big space. Uh, I'll just go quickly through it. There's Ma Rainey, who was played by a very well known South African singer, and I added three songs to it uh, in the Broadway production of Can Music. We had live music, and at the beginning of the second act, where the crisis occurs, we have her sing three songs before she has her nephew try to introduce the music so we can hear her really singing. So here's the uh, singing, and then there's uh, 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 Levy and uh, Dussie May. Dussie May is uh, uh, Ma Rainey's lover, and, uh, but it, she's also, he's interested in Levy. Levy wants to make a, uh, uh, cut his own records, and so on. He's a young guy, and as you know, at the end of the play, he kills Toledo, one of the uh, other uh, musicians, and his life is ruined. Here he's arguing with Toledo, and there's the view from the uh, directors, uh, the, the uh, uh, white producer's booth that we saw before. There's Ma Rainey actually doing the recording. Uh, I was in the uh, peculiar position of going to South Africa <coughs> and introducing South Africans to uh, African American behaviors and language. I brought in movies and so on, uh, so I was the kind of uh, uh, person did that. Now you might wonder why uh, August Wilson gave me permission to do this because uh, uh, you know uh, Lloyd Richards, who's a friend, he directed uh, uh, Wilson's plays, and 
I don't think very white directors, especially at that time, were allowed to do it. I, another part of my life which we're not dealing with is the Free Southern Theater and uh, my work in the uh, freedom movement and, and, and the political action in the South in the uh, early 60s. I was proudly the first, uh, one of the first two whites arrested in New Orleans for a sit-in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I was fairly well known in the freedom movement and when I asked to do this, Wilson gave permission. Now we're going on to three sisters. Uh, I'm sorry it's blurred, but we built this complete house in India, Cherry Kabagicha. It's not three sisters, Cherry Orchard, Cherry Kabagicha. And I, uh, I had it made uh, so it was uh, microphoned, so you could have scenes inside. A again, it was a certain kind of realism, not like cops, but uh, the audience could uh, go and, uh, and, and be very close to it. And the first act, uh, they were sitting in an outdoor theater, but the second act, we planted 200 trees. They went out into the orchard itself. And here you can see the speakers and the uh, people walking through those thin trees we planted. And uh, we uh, did the second act in the orchard. And then the third act, we set up these 300 light bulbs. Nisa Alana designed this with me. And the costumes were done by Amal Alana. They're very well-known Indian uh, uh, theater people. And the audience uh, participated and sometimes danced. And there's where Lopakin comes and says, you know, I've bought the orchard, it's mine, and he apologizes for it, but Renovskaya is, of course, devastated. In the last act, where the audience moves around to the front of the house. The first act, they're sitting and they're seeing the back of the house, and we actually built this house on stage, 10,000 tiles. Uh, Nisar and I would come at night as they were putting the house up. It was a real functioning house. And they're, then they go out, and the audience, and I, I hired this uh, double a horse and carriage to take all their possessions and leave them, and, and when they left the house, they went out into the uh, streets of Delhi. And here's the audience uh, standing watching, and then uh, Renovskaya and Gaya have a chance to go out and uh, say goodbye in the orchard, and finally Fierce is locked in. Now, uh, the next production, and I will show a brief film clip, is of uh, Three Sisters here again in New York, and I did each act in a different <coughs> style. I'm going to show you the biomechanical style uh, briefly, but this is the third act, which is during the siege of Leningrad, or in a gulag, depending on how you want to interpret it. Uh, and and uh, that brick wall is constantly built and rebuilt. We literally built a fourth wall before the audience. The first act is done as realism, as if it were in 1903 when the play uh, began. Second act, which I'll show you a film clip, is uh, 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 1923, uh, which is the uh, uh, time of biomechanics and so on. And then the 43 or 45, the Gulag or Leningrad. And the last act, everything is, uh, is uh, uh, put together. Uh, all the uh, 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 detritus from the earlier acts are there. And the, it's a radio play. The actors stand in front of the microphone to just speak it. The other actors are back there like trees and they move forward. There's no attempt to stay. Can we do the clip from uh, uh, Three Sisters? And I want you to move it forward. I'll tell you where, because we're really running late on time. And, uh, okay, uh, go forward. No, 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 b b back, back, backwards to the beginning of it. Back, back. Okay, do it, do it from there. No, yeah, go ahead. Louder. So this is the biomechanical act. This is Andre talking to the old man with a message. An old university textbook. A little louder.
Okay, enough. Enough. So uh, Paula Mary Cole played Natasha in that production, so maybe she'll say something about it sooner or later. Okay, quickly to the end of these slides. Uh, this now is tomorrow, he'll be out of the out mountains in Shanghai in uh, a new play uh, at that time in 1989 at the time in Tiananmen Square about the Cultural Revolution. Last play till this day with an overt political content in, in uh, uh, China. And I was there, I directed it, then I was evacuated by uh, the uh, State Department uh, uh, four days after Tiananmen Square, which of course was happening in Beijing, but there were huge demonstrations in Shanghai as well. You can see how orderly the uh, 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 Chinese audience, they, we didn't tell them to line up that way, they just <laughs> took that kind of position. But sometimes <laughs> when the play was much more uh, intimate outside, the first act was outside, the spectators uh, uh, loosened up and, uh, and got inside. Then the second act was inside in the theater, and it was a storytelling about a commissar, uh, a woman commissar and her love affair with her, one of her subordinates who was sent uh, 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 into the mountains during the Cultural Revolution. And here he is uh, making uh, love to her feet, which was extremely erotic within the Chinese context where the, there's a whole uh, foot uh, uh, eroticism culture. So uh, uh, wasn't allowed to kiss on the mouth, but uh, they didn't think anything of the feet, so I had him really do her feet pretty well. Uh, <laughs> at a certain point, the Red Guards come on stage. This is the political content and they're holding mouths of a book, this is 1989. They go out into the audience, they see somebody really from the audience, they bring the person on stage, dunce and so on, and they put him in the airplane pose. This was very traumatic for people. The last uh, act, uh, the, the uh, love affair between the uh, man who's sent to the mountains and a young, younger woman, he, does, he rejects the commissar and she, uh, 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 sends him away from the mountains. And we ended with a Noshi ritual, which is a, a, a drama, a, a ritual drama from a, a Guizhou province. And during that period, a, a couple of years before I did the play, I made a trip to the interior of China and I researched this uh, form. And this was done on stage and the uh, set behind the mountains were just the uh, set pieces that we saw and the play went and ended outdoors. Then most recently, and there's a full film of it, I was going to show a clip, but I'm not going to show a clip. We just don't have time. We'll see what Marvin wants to ask me and how we're going to go. What? Oh, well, uh, 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 let's just see. Maybe a little bit later. So this is, this is, uh, <laughs> this is Imagining O. It was last year at this time. It was influenced by uh, uh, Balthus and by uh, Hamlet, who I returned to several times, and Ophelia. There are no men's voices. Uh, uh, Fazia Oswald Khan, who's there, saw this production and was one of the uh, enthusiastic uh, uh, recommenders of it, and uh, one of the reasons it went uh, to uh, Montclair, uh, but also the story of O, which is a French uh, erotic novel. At a certain point, there's an interview, there's film in it. That's what I was going to show, this interview film clip between uh, Ophelia and the author of O. It's a very interesting uh, film clip, but we'll, l let's see if we have time. And then there were some very, very intimate scenes, as you can see uh, there, and the spectators off to the left. And I, uh, this uh, production took place in eight or nine or 10 or 11 spaces in and around the uh, 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 theater, Castor Theater, part of peak performances in Montclair. Some of it took place out, outdoors. Uh, a lot of water, of course, O means water in French. Ophelia drowns, the story of O, and so on, so I played with that. And then uh, there's this uh, main uh, scene called The Tipping Point, where Ophelia uh, is talking about uh, the, uh, uh, her, her monologue, her talk about the death of, uh, of uh, Polonius, and uh, the giving away of the flowers, and so on and so forth, interspersed with a narration from uh, the, the sto uh, story of uh, O itself. And then we went into a, a game uh, show in the same space, and here they're feeding flowers to Ophelia, where every spectator had to take part in this game. There were three different uh, stations that they could do. They could stuff Ophelia, that's what this was called. They could shoot a pistol full of more or less spermy fluid into the faces 
of fellow spectators or performers who put their heads through a, a wall, uh, or they could take a Balthus-like picture on the lap uh, of a have sitting on the lap uh, of a young performer who said her line is a great line. He says, "You know, uh, I may look 15, but I'm really 12." Uh, and <laughs> Uh, and, and so if you know anything about Balthus's painting, they're kind of uh, uh, beautifully executed uh, 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 child pornography pictures. But if they refused to do it, the spectators were sent to dramaturgy. And uh, the a dramaturg was a, a fierce <laughs> mistress, and uh, she existed outside. And literally, you could not see the end of the play. You had to stay in dramaturgy and learn about the play and look at some of it through the window. And several people, you know, they would say, no, but I want to, I pay for my, it's like the uh, Milai, you either had to do, we explained, you have to do one of these three things, and you're given a path to go on, or you end up in dramaturgy. So uh, that's uh, where they are. And then there were 11 different places where uh, perform, uh, spectators could go at that point. Here in the main theater, a woman is singing a song with a long wedding dress. Here in a woman's uh, bathroom, uh, uh, a woman is being drawn on and she's uh, talking about, and she wanted, I, I did not d devise these. These are things that the performers brought. And this woman, Australian professor Deborah Laser Moore, wanted to talk about her uh, mastectomy and her breast replacement and to draw on her body where she had been surgically intervened and the spectators drew on that. So this is as the water drips down from the flowers above. Again, these are things that people say to me, you know, you, your performers do the, you, you make your performance. No, I never make anybody do anything. I invite people. I see what you're going to do. I make sure that you know what you're doing, that you're consciously engaged with it. But I want something extreme. I will, uh, my privilege is to say no, not to say, and finally to say yes. Or as I think it was Grotowski told me, or maybe it was some other great director, a mise-en-scene is the least rejected of all the things to try. The least rejected of all the things tried. And unless you're willing to take a long time and reject a whole lot, you're never going to get a good mise-en-scene. It's not about inventiveness. It's about taking away. Or I, I, my formula is direction is uh, uh, subtraction. Direction is subtraction. So uh, uh, you keep subtracting until what you have left is what you're going to show. So at a certain point, there's a peep house. You can see people uh, are looking into this house. Uh, all the women are in it, but at one point, only one woman is in it, and she is making up her lips, her nipples, and her labia. And people crouch, uh, look through that to see what is going on. O Ophelia has dug her own grave outside the theater, and uh, she buries herself. Uh, uh, an owl, which is the only male figure in the play, but it's a male in a, a red uh, woman's dress. And finally, they come to the water, to the river, where Ophelia drowns herself, and waiting there is that uh, same Ophelia that had buried herself. And then all of the women jump into that uh, water, and they keep returning. I don't know how many of you, any of you see Imagining O? So you know that they went in and out and out until they were exhausted. They kept coming back and back and forth. And then on the, on the bridge there was uh, uh, the author of the story of O and Gertrude. Uh, and they interspersed the lines, Gertrude's lines about the drowning of Ophelia with uh, Pauline Riage. And finally, all that's left is the floating shirt of the drowned Ophelia. So that does my uh, slide projection for the time being. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you. So the first production was 1967 in New Orleans. The last production was uh, 2014 in uh, Montclair, New Jersey. And in between was Shanghai and New Delhi and uh, Grahamstown, South uh, Af Africa. Great. <coughs> well, Richard, oh, first a little question, and then, then we'll get serious. <laughs> The, the little question is, I, I have to ask, the peep show in O, right. the peep show building, is that supposed to be the Globe Theater? Sure. 
I thought so. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, only you would make a joke like that. <laughs> All right, uh, great. And I always liked that this circular O was an octagon anyway. It was never a circle. And but an anyway. octagon makes it an O, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, great. Um, well, uh, of course, you have... Uh, You've been to all corners of the world, uh, Shanghai, South Africa, New Jersey, um, <laughs> and uh, have, uh, have done it dazzling, uh, as we see in this, just this, this short summary, a dazzling variety of, uh, of, of theatrical approaches. I'd like to start with asking you, is there is there a through line? Uh, are there certain concerns or certain questions that you would say inform your directing as a whole? Is there some some problem, some some relationship with the audience that you feel is really central? You keep coming back to again and again. Well, I I, I think the through line, and that's why over all these years my work has changed, is a triangulation between the substance of the theater, or the ocean of it, which is the spectators. You are what we swim in. And if you're polluted, we're polluted. And if you're pure, we're pure. So that's one uh, field. The uh, particular people who come to work with me, as Brecht said, you want to build a house, use the bricks that are there. I'm much more interested in seeing what is given to me rather than saying, I need this kind of person, I need that kind of person. So when I audition, I say, I don't want you to do a monologue. I don't want to hear anything. If I audition you, I want you to walk across. I'll talk to you. I want you to do this. It's, it's people who, who uh, with me, who do we have an interaction with? Who do I enjoy looking at and listening to? Not something you've prepared. Because something you've prepared is going to be tainted by somebody else's opinion. And I'm not interested in somebody else's opinion about you. Uh, so those particular people, so, uh, and of course, uh, when I had the performance group, I worked with the same people for 10 or 12 years. The New Orleans group for some uh, few years. The East End Players, which I could talk about, which is at Provincetown, the first time I directed and when I first met Eric Bentley. Eric's going to be celebrating his 100th birthday, I think, or something close to that okay. uh, next uh, week, or this week at the uh, town hall. Uh, and, and all right, so the second is are the 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 group, and the third is my own fantasy. Where am I free? And when I run a workshop, those of you who've been in workshop with me, I say usually something to the effect as, "Here's the rules of the game. Uh, there are certain things you have to do, like yoga, breathing, and so on. But when we get that basic out of the way, and we get into the into the probing stuff, here's the rules of the game." I will ask you to do anything, not violence, not to harm yourself, but anything else, and you are free to not do it. So that I don't feel that I have to say, well, should I ask this person to do such and such? That's nasty or not nice. And you don't feel he's making me do this. And there's no blame if you do nothing. And on your part, there's no blame for me to ask. Now, usually it's not terribly difficult things, is when we talk this afternoon about workshop, about crossings and this. But I also uh, pride myself on being, well, the, the word would be uh, somewhere between persuasive and seductive, uh, between uh, creative and manipulative. You know, I mean, I'm aware of the range of meanings of these things. And those of you who have worked with me know what I say. So I, I, I can be, in my own way, charming. And I can say, all right. So I want you to walk across the room, and I want you to, uh, as you walk across the room, uh, take off your clothes. Take off some of them, or all of them. But if you don't take off all of them, you've got to stop. You can't get to the other side. So there's, there's a rule. You, you, can stay, you can stay completely dressed, but you're never going to cross the room. I might say, you know, Moses was not allowed in the promised land. He, he, he couldn't cross. Others could. So something like that. So then people will begin. You know, and I'll say, oh, but do it slowly, slower. But again, uh, so the through line is the relationship between what is going on. Now, what are my fantasies? I don't come in with preordained fantasies. 
the fantasies or imagination. My latest book is called uh, uh, Performed Imaginary. So I like to think of it as imagination, not fantasy. Because fantasy is tainted by the Freudian notion of this, uh, you know, uh, 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 Oedipal complex. Imagination, the making of an image, is something else to me. So for me, the, uh, uh, it is what I see in you. If I look at Joe Roach, or if I uh, 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 look at uh, Dan over there, Friedman, or if I look at uh, 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 Fawzia, or if I look at Rishika, you know, all of you, those of you I know, or if I look at a stranger I don't know, it evokes, uh, I have trained myself that in a certain room, at a certain time, I will be able to be in contact with what happens to me when I look at you or listen to you or work with you. Not in this context, this is too much, but in many contexts. So, and then I train myself to hopefully inhibit that in ordinary discourse and engage it in uh, 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 the discourse that comes uh, in those kind of workshop rooms. As you're crossing the line, we're in another world. So the through line is the changing conditions of those relationships. So it's not like I have an obsessive theme. There obviously is, if I look back at my work, one through line. I, I tend to emphasize women's stories. Perhaps I, I, I didn't want, I'm glad that I come from a family of four boys and my grandfather, my mother was really the only female in my uh, intimate group when I was growing up. And I was uh, uh, fascinated and, and curious about uh, women. And I've always admired something about women's uh, complexity. Uh, uh, not that men are not complex, obviously men are not, I'm a complex man, but I think women have a special complexity. So if I look back at it, three sisters, mother courage, yo costas, uh, you know, uh, uh, we, we, we can see that I'm, I'm dealing often, a, a story of O, so Ophelia, and no male voice is heard. So that, that would be a, uh, a through line that is not there at the very, very beginning, though in Dionysus, to some degree it's there because a, a, a Dionysus himself is a polymorphous, perverse, uh, quote, woman-like man. In other words, he's a god, even to the Greeks, was not the Achilles-type god. But, and he drove the women mad, like Krishna drove the women mad. He had a particular relationship with women. That story is about the women of Thebes who go nuts. And one of the exercises we did for Dionysus, I think I've said this, I bore you if you heard it before, is I told the women in the group, you go out into the rooftops of Soho. This was before Soho was called Soho and take over those rooftops. You'll have an hour and a half to set it up and get signals to yourselves. Those are the mountains. I don't care how you get to those rooms. Then we men are going to come out and capture you. We spent all day, you know, playing on the roofs of Soho. God knows why we weren't shot by cops and so on and so forth. And you're like, <laughs> from one roof and the other and, and across. Then another, another exercise when I was doing Oedipus, I said, what does it mean to pull out your eyes? That's what he does, poke out his eyes. How can we possibly approach this? Okay, let's go to a kosher butcher shop, a slaughterhouse rather. Let's watch a calf get slaughtered severe. Slit the throat, drain the blood. And I bought the head of that calf. Let's go back to the, again, the roof of the performing garage at the time. Let's go on that roof and uh, saying these lines, watching this, let's try to pull the eyes out of this a dead cow's head, which we did. Oh, and it was very difficult. Couldn't get the muscle there. Then that same cow's head I used in Faust Gastronome, cast it in uh, uh, plasticine. And then I used it again in Prometheus Project, which is not a performance that I've shown you pictures of. So the themes uh, are recursive, and they come back. And, uh, and I'm also uh, strangely gifted by being literal. In other words, if Oedipus pokes out his eyes, I want to know what that means. You know, you don't go like that. Uh, if, if, if you, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there are in the great dramas, in other words, in, in Commune, the woman playing Gloucester, uh, I had a woman playing Gloucester. You didn't see it so much in the pictures, but she had a blindfold on. And her job during the whole performance, took more than two hours, was to get from uh, 
uh, a space A through, there were different arrows. She had to touch those arrows and get to the edge of that wave and stand backward on the edge of that wave. Now she's gone for two hours and have the faith to leap off backwards as Lobster does in the, on, on the heath. And of course, he's on the heath, he doesn't fall very far because he's live, right? But uh, uh, that's the whole idea. But she had to find that way. So throughout the whole play, she's not doing anything. People are wondering. And sometimes people take her foot and put her in the right direction, the uh, uh, performance. And finally, at the murder time, when everything's being murdered, she's back there and she can hear it. And she goes, ah! And we have to run and jump and get her. If we miss, she really hurts herself. She's going backwards. It's a great act of of uh, collective faith. So uh, I, I, I did lots of uh, exercises in group faith. In, in uh, blind, uh, there was a, another one called blind leader, where you blindfold somebody and the person runs in the room. As, do you remember this one? As hard as you can, but you can't see, you'll hit the wall, you'll hit a chair, and the group has to protect you. So when you begin with that, you're blind, you're gonna go like this. You know, because you really don't want to run. But then finally you're going to go really like, right? Now I opened my eye at the end because uh, I'm not, uh, I don't have, but if, if your job was to stop me from hitting and my job was to go as hard as I can and to make the sound of what that terror is. So these are exercises which are simple and yet they generate groupness and they put us in contact with feelings that we don't usually get in contact with and how to express terror. And that in combination with certain uh, uh, exercises in breathing, yogic breathing. Some uh, people ask me before I do this, how can you do this for 12 hours? It's not much if you breathe from here. And uh, you know, it's, it's of course I'll be tired by eight o'clock tonight or 10 or maybe not. But the point is that one, you can, you can train yourself to focus and endurance. And performance is about focus and endurance, well-trained. And in relationship, I love sports, uh, within the rules, how to get as much done as possible. And in a certain sense, how to cheat and have an umpire. The umpire is the director. What can you get away with, et cetera. <laughs> Great. Uh, most of what you, I mean, this is a, 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 a wonderful condensation of, 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 of uh, work with actors. Uh, one thing that, that, that strikes me about what you say, Richard, about, uh, about your, your overall strategy, that is to say, uh, I'll make, there's a kind of collaborativeness that's very interesting Absolutely. here, that I'll make suggestions, you go as far as you choose to go, which is, of course, very different from the, the traditional idea of uh, either the, the 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 dictatorial German type director that does everything, right. or the 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 laid back director that says, you know, show me something interesting and I will respond to it. You're you're there is an interaction there. Uh, you've spoken almost entirely about the actors. It occurs to me that the way you work that strategy you've also employed with the audience. That is to say, you say, all right, here are some choices you have. It's really up to you how far you go with this, whether you're, I mean, you're, you, what you've done in a number of productions is saying, you don't have to play this game, you can do other things. Uh, that uh, is, do you, you haven't said, you've been speaking about, about the actors. Could we use this now as a bridge to say something about, about your idea of the audience and how the audience, about your collaboration okay. with yes. the audience? So one of the reasons I'm very interested, I, I wanna make sure because it's a screening, is the light okay on me or do I need to be further forward or something? The camera, I think it's okay on the camera. Okay. It's, it, it's okay? I mean, because I can see I'm in the shadow. So, I'm very interested in ritual. So uh, whether it's a true uh, etymology or not, I believe the word ritual is related to the word river. And uh, the idea of a river is that there's solid banks and there's flowing in between the banks. If you have no banks, it floods out, you have no current. If you have no flow, you have a dry riverbed, you have California. 
So uh, uh, the, the notion of ritual is a repetitive action that within a certain social context has extremely uh, radiating meaning, meaning beyond what it is. So when the priest raises the uh, wafer and the wine, it radiates, if not the actual belief in blood and flesh, it, it refers to it in a way different than ordinary theater, the willing suspension of disbelief. So I am, I am looking for the engagement of belief. As I think I said in the first hour, the transformation from make-believe into make-believe. And the audience must be the most, or the spectators, or the participators, and I use, uh, we'll talk this afternoon about rasa and rasa theory, the partaking. The, the, I think of the theater as a kind of feast, intellectual, emotional, visual, auditory, with us partaking. So now I'm in this peculiar, ironic situation where I realize I'm talking and there are 40 or 50 people out here listening, so we're, you're partaking by that way, and that's very good too. That's a kind of uh, a, a pedagogical, one kind of pedagogical model. But the other way in the theater is some kind of a ritual participation, some kind of definite interaction. And there, you know, uh, as a student, I became enamored of Meyerholtz's uh, experiments of Oklopkov's experiments, the Russians, and the notion at the heyday of the revolution at that point, before Meyerhold became the enemy and ended up at the wrong end of a bullet. Uh, 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 the, 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 the utopianism, the idea that we were building something together. And then, of course, you know I was very influenced by uh, Grotowski and the notion of the secure other, of the uh, space that was organic. And again, it wasn't so much that uh, Grotowski taught me those things because when I found Grotowski's work in the 60s, I was already doing this. It was a confirmation. But he did teach me a lot about how to work uh, with uh, actors. And I took an actual physical workshop with Grotowski in 1967, uh, his first uh, workshop and his longest workshop in the United States at NYU. So the, the spectators are co-participants. In, in the process. So my job as a director is to find spaces for you. You, uh, I'm addressing the people out here, you by habit in this kind of thing want to come in and sit down in semi-fetal position, which you're all in, right? You're not quite up like that, but you're not up and moving. So I try, and, and this is fine for this kind of uh, event, but I try in my performances, first of all, to get you moving to not give you a seat. When you find a place to sit down or stand up, as you saw in the film, you can sit or stand in a variety of ways. You can move from place to place. No fixed seating. In Dionysus, which was one of the first experiments in a large scale that I did with this, if people came, let's say uh, 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 Joe Roach uh, shows up at uh, uh, the theater with Stanley Cohen, who's sitting next to him. Do, do you, you two should meet each other. So I would say, do you know each other? No. There's Stanley. There's Joe. Now, uh, Stanley, Stanley and I were at Cornell together, you see. And Joe Roach and I, uh, I'm a, we deal with surrogation and restoration. So let's say you two decided to go to the theater together, Dionysus. So you come to the door. And I always like to work the door. I like to work the cash register. I like to work the door. So you come together. And I would say, are you two together? And you would say, yes. I said, okay, you can go in. You have to go to the back of the line. And you would say, but we've come together. I paid for my ticket. I said, I'm sorry. I don't let people in together. We're going to have to go to the back of the line. So then you say, I won't do it. I said, okay, I'll get the house manager. You talk to him. So I go inside the door. And then I would come out again. And I say, hi, I'm the house manager. What can I do for you? You say, and now you know you're being kind of played with. And I, I actually go further. I said, I'll get the director and the owner of the theater. I do that. <laughs> Finally, they realize that the lowest person, the ticket taker, is the highest person. So they have no choice. They said, well, what's my choice? I said, your choice is, you see that line of people? They, a lot of them want to come in. Either you do what I say or give you your money back. Uh, but I'm not going to let you in again. All right. Now, what does this do? So he goes in to this space. And there are no seats. And the first thing that happens when he comes in is a person says to him, Good evening, sir. And this is true. May I take you to your seat? And you, you say yes, but there are no seats. 
and you wait, and he just goes on to the next one. Good evening, ma'am. May I take you to your seat? And he doesn't do anything. He just has this line to repeat ritually. And there was a, a ritual line that we hear from ticket takers, and now is being engaged in, in, in uh, sabotage. So finally you find a place. You decide, okay, you'll find a place. He goes, now you're waiting. Joe is waiting for Stanley to come in. So first of all, now he's paying attention. He's looking at the door. He's looking around. When will Stanley come in? I don't want to be alone. I'm oh, no, I'm saving the seat for Stanley. Finally, Stanley comes in. Now, already the actor's doing some exercises in this space. So what does Joe do? He can't say, Stanley! 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 Oh, so you have these gestures, but it's not in Stanley. It's other people. And finally, St Stanley! And Stanley is also looking around. So all the way, <laughs> you're becoming engaged with the space in a way that you wouldn't if you were taking to see. See, you're looking around the space. So I try to find, that was the Dionysus strategy. In a commune, it was the taking off of the shoes strategy. In uh, uh, imagining, oh, it's women with their uh, uh, knickers, as they say in England, you know, their panties down around their knees, uh, giving lines, sitting in the various places, and you're wondering <coughs> what's going on in this dramaturgy woman who's already there with her whip and so on. So you're, you're engaged. You have to engage, and you have to uh, uh, give the audience something to do beyond sitting and waiting for something to happen. I also like to think, for the most part, that the performance has to begin before the people come to it. Rather, I mean, I don't like going into a theater when I don't like blackouts, going down to black and coming up. I mean, all those things are so boring to me. And, and they're worse than boring. They're counterproductive of the performative experience, of this ritual experience, you know. Of, so the event has to be larger than in time and space then the people come into it, so you're immediately entering like you're entering into an ocean or a river, that ritual stream. You have to give the audience, and you structure this, something to do, some challenge, which is maybe not as uh, overtly described, you know, you don't say in your program. I don't give out programs. I give programs out at the end, not at the beginning, unless I'm forced to give out. But even at, uh, imagine, oh, we gave out the programs at the end. I don't want people reading. I want people watching. And then if you want to find, it's like a movie. So if you want to find out what's going in the movie, you know, the credits come at the end, uh, et cetera, not at, not at the beginning for the most part. So all of those things to engage the audience in a, in a, in a, in a particular way. And then finally, I'm, I'm seeing Fabi's over here. So uh, I'm always a teacher. I always figure if there's nothing to teach, there's no reason to live. And uh, teaching is, to me, learning. So I guess I'm always a student. I'm always at the feet of the spectators. What can I learn from engaging them? And what can I teach them in a feedback system? And how can I be uh, articulate, conscious, and compassionate uh, in my own way? It's a maybe a rigorous compassion, but it's not a vindictive compassion. You know. I have been in my time uh, attacked and ridiculed and all, I, I know that. But I don't dislike anyone who's disliked me, you know. Uh, uh, you know, uh, history will judge for one and two. There's uh, enough uh, bile in the world to not uh, add to it. Thank you. Uh, now, obviously, what I should do now is say, let's bring everybody in and talk, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Sooner or later, perhaps. Sooner or later, sooner or later. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, uh, I, uh, I know that everybody's eager to participate, and, and uh, uh, Richard has essentially invited you to, but I'm resisting for a few minutes longer because I- Marvin has seen more performances, as Joe has testified, than anyone in the world, probably anyone in the history of the world. <laughs> we don't know the whole world, <laughs> but, uh, uh, and uh, so, he speaks from a seat of great experience and wisdom. And authority. <laughs> and authority. Uh, Especially here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, but it, it, I mean, it, it is, it, there are so many things I, I, want to, I want to ask Richard about, and, and I, so you'll have to indulge me for probably another five or 10 minutes, and then, then I, I will, will, really will open this up. Um, I, 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 I uh, so everything you say, Richard, uh, opens up other perspectives uh, that, are, that are really, which is why I've always enjoyed talking with you and, 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 and seeing the work. Uh, 
the the uh, I I have to say that uh, it just it suddenly strikes me that uh, uh, there is something special about the director who meets you at the door. Um, uh, and I'm thinking, of course, also of Ariane Nushki, who, yeah. who also feeds you uh, and I, uh, the, 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 the motif of, of sharing food is something you share with Nushki and, and, and for some very similar uh, concerns of bringing in of the audience and, and the creating of a community and so on. Uh, uh, I also remember in, 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 in a more limited but very striking way uh, when uh, Grotowski did Constant Prince down, down in the village that he ran into trouble with, uh, with Harvey at, at BAM because Harvey had given out too many tickets and so Grotowski, you may or may not remember, stood at the door and chose who went in. He didn't want the fat cats from Brooklyn to uh, uh, get in in front of the people that ought to be seeing it. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's another memorable um, uh, director at the door experience I've had. Uh, I, wonder, I wanted to ask you, uh, uh, well, several things. But one, uh, uh, a very specific thing. I, I imagine that for, for the general public, uh, if, they, if they know one production of yours, it's probably Dionysus of 69. That, as you say, much, much has been, has been written about that. Uh, I would like you to speak just a moment about, uh, uh, I, again, if, if people are quoting you, the most likely thing they are to quote is, res is the word, words restored behavior. Uh, there, there are others, but that one. And I wanted to ask you about, about Dionysus 69 and restored behavior. That is, this is one of the very few productions that I've, I have seen twice over a long period of time with an actual attempt to restore the original production. Uh, and uh, I, I'd like you to, to just say a few words about that experience. That is, what was it like seeing Dionysus, an, an, an attempt to, actu an, to actually restore the behavior of Dionysus in 69? Okay. What, was your, what was your reaction to that project and, and and how how it how it connects back to your ideas about audiences, particularly. Well, there's a backstory. So the Rude Mechanicals of Austin, Texas, did a uh, a, a redo of Dionysus in '69, and the director of the Rude Mechanicals was a student of mine, a former student of mine. So I uh, and they invited me. She invited me to uh, uh, go uh, to Austin and see rehearsals at that before they did it in Austin, and then they brought it here to New York Live Art. Did anybody in this room see that, aside from Marvin, see that uh, performance? Okay. So I advised them to not do it the way they did it. I said, you can restore the actions, but you should allow it to have its own organicity. And they said no, uh, because they would do things such as have an actor say, I'm Bill Shepard, rather than the actor saying, I'm the actor they are. So they were already playing the role of the person who was playing the role, and, that, uh, and, they, were, and they were taking quite literally the Brian De Palma film as the be-all and end-all. And I said, look, first of all, there's the book which shows all the variations, uh, or some of the variations. The film is uh, shot at two different occasions. Uh, uh, there's a backstory to that also. Uh, Brian shot it one night. If you look at the film carefully, you'll see some is brighter than others. And what happened after shooting the first night, which was the last night we were doing the play, uh, I said, did you get it? He said, I think so, but I can't be sure because it was so dark in there, I can't develop the film. This was not digital days, this was celluloid days. So I said, well, what should we do? He said, well, the safest thing we do is get is the play's closed. I said, okay. And he invited uh, students from Sarah Lawrence College where he was teaching, and I invited people, and we did it one more night, the night after it closed, with all the lights up. So now we knew we had it. So if you look at it, you'll see there's a great contrast sometimes in the night. But the second night's audience is a, is a, a much, quote, smarter audience. It wasn't the... Uh, uh, 
random audience that you get or people who want to go, but like, we're going to do this again. We want you to participate in it and be in it. Okay. So I wanted, uh, so that's the film. I wanted uh, the Rude Mechanicals to take the book or the text and to redo it with its own processes. And they wanted to do it as a replication of the film. Now, I enjoyed it. Uh, how, how can you not? You know, I mean, being, uh, I'm not a man without uh, ego and a narcissistic delight in seeing my uh, work redone. At the same time, I felt it lacked this kind of groundedness in its own possibilities. In other words, it was inevitable what happened because it was tied to that film. So if somebody like in the actual Dionysus, uh, Dionys uh, Pentheus is out to select someone from the audience. And he is supposed to select someone who attracts him, uh, man or woman. And uh, sometimes uh, uh, Pentheus, was Pentheus ever played by a woman? Dionysus was played by a woman. I don't know if Pentheus. At any rate, he was to go as far as he could go until the least resistance from his partner occurred. On one night, she didn't resist. And they decided to leave the theater together. And the play was over. So the audience was infuriated. They left. And and instead of me saying you shouldn't leave, they left. And I said to the audience, I'm sorry, Dionysus has lost tonight. I'm the director. The play is over. And people said, but we paid our money! I said, the most I can do is give you a rain check and come back another time. Another point in Dionysus, one other night, uh, uh, students who had seen the play, people came and saw it a lot, decided that it was unjust that Pentheus should suffer this and they would rescue him. So at the point that he's marked and about to die, five Queens College students, part of the CUNY system, I might add, uh, <laughs> five Queens College students came out and literally lifted him out and said, we're rescuing him, you, we're taking you away from here. And given the Dionysus game, was had a kind of game, he left with them. Now, this was different. This was not that he had won but that he was rescued. So I came out and I said, I'm the director. I want someone to volunteer from this audience to play Pentheus for the end of this play. You're going to be uh, stripped. We don't have to strip you all the way. We'll strip you to where you're comfortable. You're going to be go through this birth ritual. You're going to be marked. You're going to be killed and uh, you know, in a ritual way. And I will give you the lines that you have to say, not too many. And a young man volunteered. And I coached him through. It was very moving. The audience was gripped. Of course, at first, they thought it was a plant. Like, uh, this was all, and I shouldn't, this is not a plant. I, uh, but but this, at this point, the ritual had not been completed because of some intervention different than the game where Dionysus can lose. So uh, at each of these points, the audience, it becomes a crucial factor within the performance. Now, nothing as radical as that uh, I, I've done uh, afterwards. Uh, Oh, your question was about the Rude Mechanicals one. Well, the Rude Mechanicals one did not have the possibility of those kind of interventions. I thought it was very good, and uh, Sean Sides, who was the director, who's the uh, woman who was my uh, student, and I thought they did an excellent job of recapturing, and I thought people uh, uh, got it, but I, I wished it had had its own organicity. Great. Uh, now, one, just one more question. I'm, I'm going to circle back to where we, where we started, Richard, and that is uh, uh, the uh, when you when you were uh, talking us through the the, 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 the Indian performances, uh, the, your your uh, you remarked that when you first encountered these in '76, was it what? The, the Ram Lila? Yeah, well, Ram the Lila. first time I encountered Indian performance was in 1970, but uh, the first time I saw Ram Lila was in 76. 76. Uh, that you were, you were struck, as I think we were from the, from the film, uh, by certain uh, visual and spatial parallels between the work you'd been doing with uh, Jerry Lowell and Rojo. Uh, Rojo and the environmental uh, theater and so on. Uh, could you just say a word or two uh, 
there was, you've already mentioned the, 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 your surprise at seeing certain parallels. Were there certain things that you thought that, that you carried away that, that really changed the way you worked as a result of, of exposure to the raw media? Any, any, any specific different visions or different procedures or anything like that that you took away from that? Not that I am consciously aware of. I mean, the way uh, I do this uh, anthropological field work is to immerse myself in the event. And uh, immersing oneself in the event, of course it changes you. Uh, uh, but it's not like, again, I, I contrast myself to Peter Brook in this regard. I, it's not like I, I wanted to do their story uh, or, or to uh, uh, build uh, religious rituals into the performance. I, I do build rituals into my performance, but they're not, they're, they're again, organic to the particular performance, not you know, to do uh, uh, an arty, an illumination or something of that sort. At the same time, I'm so deeply enmeshed in the Ramlila, it must, you know, th that's a question that I think a third party would have to answer by saying, all right, here's Schechner's work before 1976, here's his work after 1976, here are some differences, and we attribute these differences to that. But for myself, part of what allows me and allows this day to exist is that I, I have both a magnificent memory and no memory at all. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what Nishik and I were talking about, because now I'm talking to you. Yeah. And then we'll have lunch and I'll talk with Marianne Ellen Sanford, and I'll talk with Joe Roach, et cetera, et cetera, and Paula Cole. So part of my stupidity or brilliance is the ability to not be somewhere else and to not carry that somewhere else with me. It sometimes gets me in a heap of trouble, I can tell you. But uh, at most part, it's, it's good. So uh, 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 allows me to, uh, to just Think into the particular moment. I know that, you know, there, there, when I first read Zen Buddhism about present centeredness and confronted the philosophical problem of there is no past and there is no future. There is only the anticipation of a future and the memory of a past. And that anticipation and memory is also occurring only in the present moment. All we have is the present moment. The rest is presumed. Combine that with something I did learn in India, that the world is Maya and Leela. In other words, you may not exist. I can get myself into a solipsistic frenzy and fantasy that what's happening here is all in my own dream. And each of you, then I would present to you, let's say we're doing a workshop. So for a moment, each of you, now I'll lower the voice, think that none of the others exist except as you are imagining them right now. Do that for a moment. Then what song would come to your mind? And can you sing it? Now, were this a natural workshop, I would wait for an hour for that song to emerge, and it would emerge. I promise you it would emerge someone would begin humming or something, and someone would join. I would stake my life and the life of those dearest to me on that. This time I interrupted it, but you were close. And that's the way I work. Great place, great place to end, and I would say in that moment, which is the moment of eternity, is where freedom is. It was Eliade or somebody who wrote the Eternal Present, uh, that uh, book. Eliade. It was Eliade, right? Yeah. Okay, Mercy Eliade, right? Okay. Uh, okay, I'm going to open the discussion up to the audience now. Uh, tell me about. Now I wanted to ask about the song. song. What's song. It? You're recording it, so. I wanted to ask about songs, music, and dance. I didn't notice any musicians in the Ramayana. I'd be surprised if an Indian production didn't have songs and music 
some form of dance in it, though. It is a uh, sacred ritual. Okay, there, there are two forms, at least, of, of music and dance in the Ram Lila. The Ramayanis, we didn't play the movie, are chanting the Ram Charit Mani. Uh, Risha, can you chant a little bit of it? Do you, can you get that music? Do you have it? Yeah, well, anyway, if we had time, we could listen to the music. But it, it, they chant it, and it has cymbals and drums, and they're chanting it. Then the, uh, ba, the uh, sadhus and others join them in, uh, an, uh, I don't know if you know the word bhakti, but the uh, devotional, the bhajans, the singing, Sita Ram, Sita Ram, Sita Ram, Jay, Sita Ram, Sita Ram, Sita Ram. Sita Ram J Sita Ram. Okay, and they do that, and they c continue to. It's like the Hari Krishnas, but it's uh, it's. Uh, don't ask me about the Hari Krishnas too much. <laughs> the, uh, uh, they are they they are doing the, these these uh, men, and they're singing, and they're singing their devotion. And bhakti is a, a form of emotional in, uh, engagement. So I remember when I first got introduced to bhakti in the true sense before. I did Ramli, that was when I went to see the place, the Samadhi place of Ram Krishna, near to uh, Ramakrishna, near to Kolkata now, as it's called, Calcutta, where this great ecstatic saint of uh, several centuries ago uh, uh, was absorbed into the uh, absolute. Now, do I believe that? Yes and no. See, that's why I'm in the theater. When I'm in that place, in that time, in that present, of course I believe. My name is Ajaya Ganesh. I was initiated in a temple in the south of uh, India. Mm -hmm. But I'm also a Jew. I'm a Jindu. I'm not also an atheist. I'll do some of that reading tonight. You'll see the contradiction. I am so comfortable with those contradictions. I would be so uncomfortable with a complete coherence. Mm -hmm. Because I think the profoundest coherence, mm -hmm. as quantum theorists would say, is a deep indeterminacy and non-locality. You know what non-locality is in physics? When this thing turns and way over here on the other side of the universe, this thing turns at the same time or at no time. Uh, or the answer, I don't want to get too philosophical, the answer to the problem of the universe is neti, not that. In other words, uh, there's a long story about neti. In other words, what happens before the Big Bang? It's neti, not that. In other words, the the negative, which is so important in the restoration of behavior, is what happens at that, at that point. In other words, the Big Bang creates time and space. Therefore, there isn't time or space before it. And it's a metaphor for that. You can't say time or moment because you, we want to. Our human urge is always to want to conceive of an envelope in which the message can be put, no matter how large the message, the infinite beyond the infinite. But the truth of the present moment is, is the, 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 the point of nothing is the same as the everything. I can't get you any closer to that than that. Uh, and um, so uh, what was your question? Music. Oh, sing. music. And so they're you, singing. You like to bring it into your production. They're singing. They're, they do sing in the Ram Lila. I use a lot of music in my productions, obviously. <laughs> Oh yes, play play it. Just listen to it. This is the, the Ramayana. Yes. Quiet. Pay attention. Be quiet. Listen. That's what he said. And that's the sambad. Here we go. Pretty active. And this goes for 41 days, not 31 <laughs> days. Because 10 days before Robin is born, there's a whole lot of text that sets it up. And they're in the second story of a building singing for 10 days before the actual perform the actual drama begins. Because the whole text has to be spoken. So the text, this is again this contradiction. The text makes its claim of entirety. And the drama makes its claim of particularity. And both claims are fulfilled in that performance. So that's what I learned. It's not so much that I 
learned it, but I found it confirmed in the reassuring that you have to, in a certain sense, accept the entirety and locate within it the particularity. Rather than, that's what I said, I want my performances to begin before people enter into the space. If I were to do that today, what would have happened was Rish and I would be talking and you'd be coming in rather than waiting for an introduction. But that's not the uh, convention of this kind of meeting. But were I to stage it a second time, a Richard Schechner day we go, we would start and you would come in after it had begun and you would, uh, we would not be able to stop until you were all gone. <laughs> Might be a long time. in that situation, Richard, that is to say we were in the things, we were showing slides and so on and so forth, so to speak, continue together, which I assume will be true all day. So uh, Yes, that's we, true. We have something of that. I'm, I'm sure somebody has a comment or a question. I, I have. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Oh, it was such a pleasure listening to the two of you. Thank you so very much. Uh, Richard, I had a question about technology and particularly in cases of uh, performances as old as um, the Ram Leela that uh, you have shown clips of. And the fact that the Ram Leela is also performed all over India in different shapes and forms. Um, and these days we find that there are ho there's a whole lot of te technology that is being used, even digital media. Now what do you feel about that? Well, first of all, the Ram Leela of Ramnagar, which is the one that I know most. Uh, it's not that it rejects technology, it is frozen technology at a certain point in time. So I'm assuming that before uh, there were Petromax lanterns, you know, steam, uh, pressure lanterns, there was the Ramlila, but it was not illuminated by that point. And a Petromax lantern became a kind of advanced technology and it was brought in. We know that in the 1940s, the Maharaja at that point wanted to bring in microphones because as you, we almost heard the Samba, they have to go, Bahat! Ranji! You know, they have to, because there are 30,000 people. So he thought microphones would be good. So we set them up. The crowd came and ripped them out. Wires, <laughs> microphones, and all. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted this. So it's not the question, we, we live in, we, we've had technology for probably several hundred thousand years. We are always comfortable with the technology we are born into and a little stretched by the ones coming. So the first people that were able to do a Clovis, you know, that kind of uh, a blade that we find over North America, a very, very sharp blade that you can really get a buffalo with. Well, that was high technology. So whoever could flake that, etc. So the Ramla, so it's not a question of technology. It's a question of which generation of technology does one accept. The Ramla of Ramnagar accepts uh, somewhere around turn of the 20th century, not 20th to 21st, but 19th to the 20th, some uh, technology uh, around that uh, uh, time. I'm sure, however, I mean, somebody else would have to do the uh, deeper study that the fabrics of the costumes have changed that, uh, you know, how they're made and all of this kind of stuff. So there's a step down. Now to answer your other question, I, because I like the Ram Nagar Ram Lila so much, I am not enamored of either, you know, the television Rama, I, I know about it, you know, and worshiping the television set, or high technology, uh, the Delhi Ram Lila, no. but, but that's my taste. I like this particular enactment. I realize it is, uh, it is to some degree, I wouldn't say frozen in time, it's molten in time, in its own time. So, but that's a question of, of my own taste. Uh, when I turn to my own theater, I love the Builders Association. I love the Worcester Group most of the time. <laughs> uh, but I, I do like the technology and I do like the, the so it's, I'm not an op, op, opposing technology, but I'm so, engaged in the Ramnagar Ramlila that it serves as my model. Uh, and uh, uh, so that's my answer to that.
Yes, could you speak to the use of uh, nudity in a specific scene or a performance in terms of the acting and what your meaning and use of that is? Okay. Now, I always use the term nakedness because nudity to me has the uh, uh, reference to a certain tradition in art. <coughs> like we paint nudes, not naked. And, uh, and I, I use the uh, uh, body or engage the body and not within the frame of that tradition. Uh, again, I have a certain contradiction. Uh, I love to see naked bodies. I love dressed bodies too, but uh, I, I, I just like the, the, the form and shape of them and, uh, and in, in, in motion. So that's a personal predilection that I in, enjoy that. Although, you know, I, I don't enjoy it enough that I've never been to Sandy Hook where there's a, a, a naked beach. So I like it within the context of work rather than just a group of naked people. I've never been to a nudist camp or anything like that. Uh, I think it's one of the options one has within the framework of uh, 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 directorial and performer uh, arsenal or whatever you want to call it, equi uh, 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 equipment. So in my workshops, I almost always have a place where nakedness can be performed. And if we see some of the uh, film this afternoon, we might see some of it. But again, it's, it's always optional, but so is dress. In other words, I'm not, I don't think of myself as a prude. At the same time, I am born within a, 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 a deeply prurient and prudish uh, society, which remains prurient and prudish. So that nakedness has a different quality to it than, uh, 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 let's say, wearing a wedding ring. Mm -hmm. If it was a completely neutral society, it wouldn't make any difference. Whatever you do to your body, if you don't harm it, is within the same range and something should not be particularly, but we don't, we live within that context. All right, as I do uh, particular performances, they generate the need for it or not. So for example, uh, Mother Courage, there was no uh, call for any kind of nakedness. Although when we rehearsed, well, not Mother Courage, but when we were doing the workshops and working, there was a lot of nakedness. But there was no call for nakedness in Mother Courage. In fact, she was always about guarding herself. She was about acquiring a property. She was about covering up, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in Oedipus, there was no need for nakedness until the end, until he learned what we call the naked truth, which actually engaged his nakedness in a sexual act with his mother and her with him. At that point, we needed nakedness. So you see what I'm saying? To me, it's not a thing in itself, except in the workshops, I do enjoy it. I would be a liar to say I don't. But in the artwork itself, it depends on the particular circumstance and which performances use it and when and how. I've also been careful, because I know the history to some degree of the exploitation of women in particular, to move towards the naked male as well as the naked female, but never to have a performance in which there'd only be uh, naked uh, women. Uh, in uh, Imagining O was an exception because there were only women in the play, there, uh, except for the one man who was in the uh, uh, wet, uh, owl mask. But otherwise, like in Dionysus, Dionysus is naked. In Commune, he uh, uh, Edward II is, uh, the, the character is doing that role. So I, I, I play back and forth with that and not just fetishize the uh, a woman's uh, uh, a body. I don't know if that answers it, but it's like, it's a case by case thing. If you look at my whole oeuvre, it doesn't occur all the time. But where I think it is uh, relevant, it does occur. And in the workshop, I think it is very relevant to dress and undress. One of my exercises is you line up on two sides of the row, and uh, oh, I'll, I'll just do it briefly. So it's called dress to kill. So I tell them, I always do this, I say, come in tomorrow dress to kill. So of course everybody says, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, what does dress to kill mean to you? Because of course in their imagination, it could come in with the AK-47 or they could come in <laughs> dressed beautifully, you know, whatever, dress to kill. I said, we're not gonna harm each other, but dress to kill. So they come in and usually it's like, really come in beautifully. And then you line up 
and I say, okay, it's a slow motion. I think I talked about this before this morning. You're going to go as slow as you can, and I demonstrate. I'll just demonstrate with this hand. Now, you may not notice it, but I am moving my right hand. I am moving it continuously. I am actually, that's the, the speed I want you to move. That great. So if you, if we were standing here even longer, I'm moving it. I'm aware I'm moving it. So I've moved it from there to there. All right. So you're going to cross. And as you cross, you are going to disrobe. And you leave the, your clothes in the middle. Now you can take off none, some, all. Whatever you find down there, you can pick up and put on. You can meet people in exchange. It's going to take a couple of hours, right? By the time they come back and they're lined up on this side again and on this side, all the clothes have been shared, or many of them, and the dress they get is a spectacular uh, visual uh, thing. Or you'll see if we show the uh, workshop 2009, which we filmed, the banquet where we start naked and we dress, but the table is already dressed. Then we dress ourselves and so on. So uh, we, we, we play with these things in, in, in the workshop, but it's always in the dialectical tension and development between uh, overdress or superdress or costume, ordinary dress, nakedness. You know, there's that kind of uh, pendulum. We're all dressed more or less ordinarily. But what glorious things we could do if we began to exchange what we have, even in this room. But if I ask you all to come tomorrow dressed to kill, we'd have a bigger repertoire <laughs> of opportunity. Well, it, it is now new. I'll take one more question. Yes. Well, let, let's do two because he has to do his. Two. All right. Here. Yeah. Yes. Okay. We need Go on, Lisa. Quick question. Um, this may be a very dangerous analogy, but um, when we were talking about. Uh, Ramlila, we did talk about multiple texts and coming to imagining, oh, I do see a lot of texts again. And within this multiple layering of, again, the different times, different women, different texts, what is your relation with language? Um, right. Both in Ramlila, coming all the way to imagining, oh. Right. Well, uh, do this briefly because I know it's new. I like to uh, collage or assemble or montage texts. In that sense, I feel I'm like a filmmaker more than a theater maker. I think the tradition of drama is to honor the playwright's text. You know, and b believe me, I've been attached to doing this to this playwright or that playwright. But in film, even though there are screenwriters, the director is the person who gets the top credit with the actors, and one takes the text and plays with it. So I like to play with text. I like multiple texts because of their reverberation, and they're playing off one against the other. So in Ramlila, there are these layerings of Rama texts, let's put it that way. Some of them behavioral, like the bhajans and the dancing and so on. Some of them literary, like the uh, uh, Ramchart Manas and uh, Sanvad. And some of them ghost texts, like the Ramayan, which is not there, but which is there, because that's the source of the narrative. So I like to take multiple texts and, and, and play with them off against each other. And in that sense, I like to think that from the most sophisticated spectator to the spectator with the least knowledge, they can all have pleasure, but it'll be a different pleasure. It's rasa theory, which we're talking about. It's a different pleasure. So if you know the story of O, if you know that Pauline Réage is really Anna Duclos, uh, and you know Anna Duclos' history and the relationship to Jean Paul Vert, you'll have a different relationship to imagining O than if you don't know that, or you only know it as a, quote, dirty book. If you really know your Shakespeare, and hear only the woman's lines from all of Hamlet, and every woman's line is spoken, but no man's line is spoken, you'll have a, so when, when you hear all this, yes, my lord, no, my lord, I thought you did, my lord, you'll hear Hamlet in a certain way. His absence is his presence. But you'll hear her really enunciating which if you played the scene with his speech, of course she doesn't get much to say. No, my lord, yes, my lord, I thought you did, my lord. But if you only hear that, and then if you hear her present it as if she's Queen Elizabeth II, no, my lord, with that queen way, you'll have another reference. So all of this, so the more sophisticated you are, uh, I hope with me, you match me and maybe exceed me in reference. But my job also is to make sure that if you know none of that, 
you're having a good time. <laughs> so that gives us the last question. I'm not sure if this is a question. Uh oh, um, I better sit down. It's, um, <laughs> as you've been speaking today, some ideas from Alexander training have been resonating. Um, one is you can either have the experience or you can have the understanding and analysis of the experience, but you can't have both. I don't believe that. I, I can tell. And the other one, the other one from his um, aphorisms is, how can you do something you don't know if you keep on doing what you do know? Okay. And it, I just thought it might be fun to hear you play with that. Well, first of all, the first one, uh, I don't even remember what it was anymore, but I don't agree with it. <laughs> it it's like trying to be an experience and critical. You know, ever since I first read Brecht, I thought of critical, experi crit critical position and experience as in a dialectical that is uh, alternating relationship or simultaneous relationship or you know uh, triune brain, four brain doing one thing, the base of the brain doing the other. So I don't believe that. The, the second one, what was the second one? How can you do something you don't know if you keep on doing what you do know? Well, uh, first of all, I would say as a matter of principle, we only have ignorance to work with. So whatever it is we do, even if we think we know it well, we're really ignorant about it. Uh, I'm speaking the English language. I think I know it pretty well. I think I can handle it with great articulation. I think I can construct a sentence, but I don't know it. You know, I, I, I love the notion that so-called knowledge is like a little boat on an ocean of ignorance. And it's the ocean of ignorance that is fascinating, that we're sailing. So I don't think of the dialectic between knowing and not knowing. Everything is not knowing. And knowing is a bit of not knowing temporarily disguised as something else. <laughs> but it's still not knowing. So even, the, and what ritual teaches us is that even repeating something for the thousandth time is different. If one repeats it with a whole heart, as uh, you know, uh, Castaneda would say, or something like that. In other words, if you enter into something, so I don't see, see the distinction. Uh, now, I have to say that I've never practiced the Alexander technique. To me, Alexander is a Greek general. I kind of <laughs> admire his movement over into uh, India uh, at one point. Well, I didn't. I liked his teacher a lot. Uh, Aristotle was his teacher. But uh, so I, I don't have any direct experience with the Alexander technique. So I'm just responding to your statement about his assertions, not to the technique itself, since I don't know it. Okay. Thank you, Richard. It's been wonderful. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank